And the season starts right now here on Anglia with a live game from South End, an Anglia sports special. You are the number one. Good afternoon, football is back and so are we. A new season and three hours of action here to launch it in style. Hopefully we shall be meeting on a regular basis on Sunday afternoons and indeed in midweek once the autumn has moved in on us with coverage of the Coca-Cola Cup and First Division football. The live Sunday match is the main feature of this afternoon and that means Roots Hall where it should have been the return of Stan Collymore. Southend's hero last season and leading goal scorer, a record close season sale he had been brought to be a key figure in Nottingham Forest's First Division rebuilding programme. So it's Southend under Barry the Hat Fry versus Nottingham Forest under new management, live from Roots Hall at 3 o'clock, but without the star turn. Even so, the show goes on, as they say, top billing in the studio, David Pleat, refreshed, fighting fit, ready to go? Yeah, fine. Pleased, relieved. Delighted with yesterday's result, so started off OK. Getting off with a win. Yep, delighted. They've called us out down at Roots Hall. We're expecting Stan the band to do the business. Oh. You've got a theory as to why he's not playing. Oh, no, I think at the risk of appearing cynical, we should scrutinise the transfer agreement. <laughs> we don't know what Clause 4 might have said. Perhaps he can't return to Essex for a period of two years. Careful, their lawyers are watching. He was in fine fettle at Cambridge United in a friendly last week, and uh, it's just a shame that uh, he's out. OK, but the show does go on, as I say. Plenty on offer. Southend versus Forest, our live match. Highlights as well from other First Division games in a moment. And, of course, we'll be keeping tabs on what's happening down at Carrow Road. Norwich against Manchester United. Along with a special feature later in the afternoon, Luton Town against Watford. Well, intercepted by Marvin Johnson. Johnson going forward. He's in with a chance here. Johnson, good save. Another brilliant bit of play by Simon Shepherd. Here's Ken Charlery, wide to Gerard Lavin. What for the push to lot the players up? Furlong's asking for the deep pass. This is for Furlong. Gets it well! Great header and a superb save from Jürgen Sommer. And they're both at it. Yes, the local derby from Kenilworth Road coming up later this afternoon. So then, it's a new season, many new faces, plenty of fresh ambition in the first division. Let's now look at some of the highlights from yesterday's games, starting with Derby County against Sunderland. Derby County were the surprise team of last season. The surprise was they never looked like getting promotion despite a massive investment in new players. But they made a good start this time. Mark Pembridge's penalty put them ahead against Sunderland after 10 minutes. Needless to say, Derby are promotion favourites again this season, and they looked the part yesterday. A fine move, giving Marco Gabbiadini the chance to make it 2-0 with five minutes left in the first half. Last season, it was Derby's home form which let them down, but they knew there'd be no repeat of that particular failing yesterday when Pembridge scored his second of the game on the stroke of half-time. So a good day for one former Luton player, but for another, it was a sad start to life at a new club. Alec Chamberlain joined Sunderland in the close season, but despite saving here from Paul Simpson, he was unable to prevent Paul Kitson making it 4-0. And his miserable day was complete just moments later, when Craig Short added his name to the score sheet to give Derby the country's most emphatic opening day victory. Derby 5, Sunderland 0. Wolves have spent a fortune in the summer. Jeff Thomas, Kevin Keane, David Kelly and others but it was the old faithful Steve Bull who showed all his characteristic hunger and power with their first goal. Ninth minute, Bull in brilliant form. But Bristol City were tough opponents themselves and hit back in the second half when fullback Martin Scott raced down the left, thought about a cross, shot instead, and in it went. Wolves regained the lead in the 69th minute when Russell Osmond's men got into a tangle goalkeeper a mere spectator as Derek Mountfield heads in. 
and Wolves were down to 10 men after Mark Venus had been sent off when they scored their third. Kevin Keane's cross, Steve Bull in like a flash, 3-1 to Wolves, Bull is on the charge already. Relegated Middlesbrough made a good start with victory at Notts County, thanks largely to the contribution of teenager Alan Moore. He set up Paul Wilkinson for the first goal of the game after 19 minutes and then decided to take over the scoring role himself. His first came a minute before half-time as he beat county keeper Steve Cherry from 20 yards. And he was on target with his second and Burroughs third just a couple of minutes after the break. Cherry helpless again as the ball flew over his head. But after that, County were able to rescue their pride at least and come close to rescuing a point. They made it 3-1 from the penalty spot. New signing Gary McSwegan brought down by Stephen Pears. Pears escaped with just a booking but was comfortably beaten from the spot by Mark Draper. Then, six minutes later, Canty pulled another goal back. This time, McSwegan created the chance for substitute Gary Lund. But Canty were unable to force an equaliser, and it ended Notts County 2, Middlesbrough 3. And a spectacular start for Phil Chappell. From Cambridge to Charlton for £100,000 this week, a quick free kick, Scott Minto's cross, and there's Chappell with what proved to be the winner. That was the 38th minute. He'd already had five stitches in a head wound. The new squad numbers, an optional extra for the First Division this season, were very much in evidence as Charlton buzzed about the place, but despite hard work from both sides, no further goals, and it ended as a memorable day for Chapel in the Valley. 1-0 to Charlton. Portsmouth are another team strongly fancied for promotion, but they made a false start at Oxford, falling behind after 19 minutes, an own goal from Kit Simons. Pompey have invested £250,000 in former lead striker Lee Chapman. He looks a bargain. He scored his first for the club midway through the first half. If many expected Portsmouth to use that as a springboard to three points, well, Oxford had other ideas. They went ahead again after 40 minutes. Chris Allen, the scorer. But Portsmouth, who so narrowly missed out on a Premiership place last season, levelled again just before the break, when Mark Simpson's cross eventually reached Chapman. He made it 2-2. But the game turned Oxford's way again after 64 minutes when they were awarded a penalty. Allen's cross fan Jim Magilton and referee Steve Dunn spotted a handball from Mark Chamberlain. Portsmouth, who'd had their own penalty appeals turned down just moments earlier, were furious. But Magilton ignored the delaying tactics to give Oxford an impressive opening day victory. Oxford 3, Portsmouth 2. Stoke City's introduction to the First Division started badly when Millwall's Ian Bogey burst through in the 14th minute and somehow squeezed his shot under the goalkeeper's body. Stoke's equaliser goes to the top of the early season howlers. A back pass from Tony McCarthy going horribly wrong. All that pre-season optimism down the drain. But it all came right for McCarthy and Millwall when Stoke were opened up in the 62nd minute for American international Bruce Murray to celebrate his debut in English football with the winner. Stoke had late chances, but the score ended Stoke 1, Millwall 2. The start of a new season and already the end of one proud run for Peterborough, who'd been unbeaten on the opening day since the mid-70s. Not sure if new signing Mark Peters is suspicious, but he won't forget the 13th minute of his debut in a hurry. Penalised there for a challenge on Gary Mills, which gave Steve Thompson the chance to open Leicester's account from the penalty spot. Now, you never know where David Speedy's going to pop up next. Filbert Street, his latest stop, and indeed, here he was, popping up with the header, which dropped just right for Tony James to poke the second. 2-0 and just 15 minutes gone. Peterborough might have been rocking, but they kept their cool and were back in it before half-time. Courtesy of another rush of blood, this time Leicester's Mike Whitlow on John McGlashan. Certainly no lack of commitment on the opening day. And it was Gary Cooper's turn to score from the spot. And Cooper doing a very good job of silencing the crowd in the process. The second half was a different story, or at least it should have been, with the United's Dominic Iorfa given the perfect chance to make the first day headlines. Two stabs at this chance before he squared it back for Tony Adcock. The ball, though, had already run out of play. And while Posh stepped up a gear after the break, Leicester seemed to lose their way. 
There were chances, but United keeper Ian Bennett was in fine form. Steve Walsh denied there, and by now the bulk of the chances were coming at the other end. I offer with lightning pace, seizing on a poor back pass. One on one. But this time City keeper Gavin Ward came out on top. I offer had been brought in when Tony Philiscope failed a late fitness test. The Nigerian international looks a real prospect, if he can supply the finish to match the approach. Away he went again, but once more the chance went back. Nothing to show for so much good work. Posh left to count the cost of the two minutes of first half madness. Yeah, we had it for about a month last year and we couldn't put a finger on, on it why that happens. And you, you talk to other people what they do and when they've been in the same position, but they said they couldn't put a finger on it. We tried to do things in training, tried to slow the game down at times, but it just seems that we just have a lapse now and again and it always costs us dearly. For the second half, we went out with all uh, guns firing and I thought the forwards did very well. We had five one-on-ones where you expect at least to put two of them away and come away with a win. Well, David, plenty of goals there, most of them in the right end. Any pointers for the season? No, I think uh, Steve Bull um, has now got enough good people backing him there to get goals again this season. Derby, a lot of people's favourites this season, didn't do as well as expected last year, but maybe it takes time even for expensive players to settle and they should go well. There'll be a very interesting game this week, Forest v Derby at Nottingham. And um, I think all round it's a very attractive league. Uh, Middlesbrough cut in the cloth having had a relegation. Sunderland in the North East uh, trying to emulate Newcastle a little bit. Uh, Portsmouth were very attractive last season, have been very unlucky for two years. Crystal Palace will be strong. Millwall were excellent footballers last year and if they continue that they'll have a shout. So I think all in all, when you think of the Midlands teams and the tremendous rivalry there with Forest and Derby and Leicester, of course, I think it's going to be a very exciting and attractive season. An exciting league, an attractive league, but I noticed in the press this week you were making the point that the gulf between the Premiership and the rest of you, second, first, and, uh, first, second and third divisions, is getting bigger. You, you're worried about uh, the financial side of the game. Well, I think that's always a worry. I mean, we accept the gulf, um, but it mustn't widen too much. I feel that when you're buying players for millions of pounds, and there was over £40 million pounds spent this summer, in really the pursuit of clubs in the Premiership, determined not to lose that um, elitist title. They have to stay there. And it just worries me, the wages get pushed up and spiral upwards. And of course, when players get released or when clubs try and sell players from this league, the clubs lower down just cannot afford their wages or in the pursuit of glory they try and pay them what they're asking and as a result get into terrible financial difficulties so that there is a gulf and it is getting wider and i believe that last year some of the football played in division one was excellent as good as it's been for years and most of the teams were playing good football OK, David, we'll leave it there and hopefully we're in for some good football today. Time for a break. Luton versus Watford is coming up later and a chance to win one of these Rothman yearbooks just fresh from the printers. But coming up next, it's Southend versus Nottingham Forest live from Roots Hall. Hello again. Now, it won't have escaped your notice that Manchester United are at Norwich this afternoon in the Premiership. That doesn't start until four o'clock, and we'll keep you in touch with what's happening down at Carrow Road. But first, it's Southend and Forest, and a new start, of course, for Brian Clough's successor at Forest. A regime which ended in tears and relegation will never obscure Brian Clough's contribution to the game, or the very difficult task of the man who follows the legend. Frank Clark, a European Cup winner under Clough, and 12 years at Orient as manager and managing director. He's a straight-talking man, I think. I found him over the sort of the few months that I've known him very straight-talking and very honest. Uh, I think if someone's like that anyway, you can't go wrong. I've not made decisions and thought, well, will that be different? Will that change things? Will the players accept it? I've just, uh, I've just made the decisions on, on the basis of what I know and what I feel. Um, we, some of the things we have changed, some of the things I, I'm sure will, will still be the same. But I'm not conscious of it at all. Uh, but I do realise that, that, that comparisons are going to be made, and I mean, I can't do anything about that. Retaining Stuart Pearce, signing Stan Collymore, solid achievements already for Clark, but he's sold three internationals from a relegated side, so he'll need everything Collymore can offer. Which is not a lot today, of course. How do you follow Brian Clough? 
Well, I think uh, Frank Clark can handle it. I think he's one of the few that could. He's, he's intelligent, he's generous, he's straight, as uh, Pierce says. No doubt about that, he's straight. And I uh, think that that's uh, good for the players. He's there to steady the ship. It's the most important year. They've not only lost a legend, but they've been relegated. And that's hard to bear. And often the supporters expect and need to come back in the first year. So Frank Clark will keep the continuity, if you like, and keep the, uh, keep the staff together. OK. Kick-off at Roots Hall. It's 3 o'clock. It's their official start to the season. First of all, though, let's get a word from the front line. South End manager Barry Fry, who looks as if uh, he'd like to play this afternoon. Yeah, it's a great occasion for us, and uh, Forest are favourites to go back in the Premier League, and we're favourites to get relegated, so uh, we aim to upset the odds a little bit today. Now, the big team news here before the kick-off is, of course, the absence of Stan the Man, Stan Collymore. Your reaction to that? Who? Stan. Yeah, it's, it's a big shock for me, you know. I thought he'd be nervous, to be honest, uh, coming back here because he was very much a hero, and rightly so. But um, so I don't really know the reason why he isn't playing. He's not even here, so he must have missed the bus or something. He's got tonsillitis. Oh. Well, I'm sorry to hear that because I did want him to score a few goals because we get a quarter of a million pounds if he scores 25 goals this year, and he might have done that today. And you couldn't really have picked up a opposition, could you, on day one, Forrest, even without Stan? Oh, yeah, without a doubt. Well, Barry Fry is uh, on fire there, without a doubt. And uh, just to give you an idea of what's happening down at Roots Hall, he's, he's livening him up, David, with uh, what is happening here, a little bit of aerobics. Yeah, a little bit of stretching, looks like hamstrings, calves, groins, the usual exercises that players... A lot of people, in fact, Forrest have uh, employed a fitness coach this season, specifically for stretching and... And athleticism, but that's a little bit different. Well, nothing's <laughs> different when you listen to Barry Fry, is it? You know, I mean, he hasn't. Uh, Barry's the extreme extrovert, and uh, I'm sure that if they're successful this afternoon, they'll probably have three young ladies out there next week. Well, why not? More the merrier. Tell me then, Nottingham Forest favourites to go up. You would expect them to to do what today? Go there even without Collymore and get a good result? Well, they do play a methodical game, Forest. They pass the ball, and I'm sh quite sure all their first division experience that they won't panic in the euphoria of the occasion, which some might say should suit Southend. But Collymore was bought for thrust and punch and they didn't score goals last season. And I feel without Collymore, Forrest are, or will be, uh, not the side, uh, the same side. And um, I feel that this afternoon it's a good draw. I would hope we see a few goals. I'll predict 2-2. Two 2-2, -two. Two -two. that's not bad. OK, well, it's time now to cross over to Roots Hall. The commentary team this Thank afternoon is John Helm with Ray Clements. A win for Millwall and Wickham's big day. But now, let's join our commentary team of Ray Clements and, first of all, John Helm. Well, it's close to being a sellout here at Roots Hall. There's been a real buzz in the town ever since the fixture list was printed and it decreed that Frank Clark's first game as manager of Forest in succession to Brian Clough should be here. So let's have a look then at the first Forest side named for a league game by Frank Clark. It is number one, Mark Crossley in goal. At two, a new signing from Swansea, Des Little. Stuart Pearce, the England captain, wears three. Colin Cooper, another new boy, at four. Steve Chettle is five. Steve Stone, six. Kingsley Black wears seven. Neil Webb's in the number eight shirt. Robert Rosario is at nine. Lee Glover, as we've heard, in place of Stan Collymore at ten. And Ian Wone at eleven. Forrest will pack their midfield with four men. Kingsley Black will play down the right, Ian Wone down the left, and they'll be looking to Steve Stone to do the sort of job Roy Keane performed so successfully before his move to Manchester United. Robert Rosario partners Glover up front. Well, there is some good news for Forrest. Stuart Pearce, bedeviled for so much of last season with a groin injury, is back and eager to rediscover his top form, not only for Forrest, of course, but for England as well. He says he's gone well in pre-season training, he's raring to go, albeit in the first division, rather than the Premier League. It's the first time he's played at this level, and he's just signed a new four-year contract as well. Now then, let's have a look at the South End lineup. They have Paul Sansom in goal, Andy Edwards at two, Chris Powell is three, Keith Jones, the captain, wears four, Pat Scully at five, and Graham Bressington makes his debut at six. Andy Anser, seven. Derek Payne, one of several signings from Barnet at eight. Andy Sussex at nine. Ricky Otto, an exciting talent at ten. And Brett Angel will be 11. Southend also favour a 4-4-2 formation.
Pressington is in because Mick Bodley has an ankle injury. He partners Pat Scully in defence. Scully and Powell, by the way, were both doubtful, but it's OK. And Andy Sussex's experience gets hits the job of playing up front alongside Brett Angel, ahead of Gary Jones, a summer signing from Boston, who's on the bench. The referee for the occasion today has come from Cambridge. He is Mike Bailey. Now, of course, uh, this season, a new introduction to the Football League, as well as the Premier League, is that we have three substitutes on each side. So both sides have named a substitute goalkeeper as well as the other subs. So young Gary Jones there alongside Simon Royce and Jonathan Hunt for South End. Brian Laws, Lee Harvey, who's on a three-month trial from Lake Norwich, and Andy Marriott for Nottingham Forest. Ray Clements, you could not have had a more perfect day. The sun beating down at Roots Hall. It's a terrific way to start the season. Apart from the climb up of this gantry, it certainly is, yes. It's, uh, the pitch is looking in marvellous condition. There's you know, a great turnout of Notts Forest supporters to give them support here, and, uh, and South End have turned out in force as well. So a smashing atmosphere, and I'm sure that it will be a very, very exciting game. We just got a glimpse of Brett Angel there as well, one of South End United's leading goal scorers, and he very much in the shot window today. A number of Premier League clubs represented in the crowd, and uh, we're keen to have a look at Angel, who's playing on a week-to-week -week contract basis at the moment. South Ender in all blue, Forest wear their red shirts and white shorts. There is Angel getting his first touch from the ball forward from Powell. Rosario and the first challenge of the game from Bressington produces a free kick. Vastly experienced player Bressington, although he came into league football uh, quite late on at Lincoln City. But he's conceded that free kick. And the one thing Southend will not want to do is to concede an early goal. Forest, remember, are the favourites to win promotion, 5-1. Southend quoted at 40 to 1. There's Pierce, a thundering challenge from him, and he looked to use his elbow to me on the back of Andy Ansar and a booking within the, the first 60 seconds for England's captain, Stuart Pierce. Yes, unfortunately, Stuart Pierce is obviously very hyped up for this game. He's not played for some while. We see the challenge there. And this, his arm was up, but I don't think he actually came down viciously with his, with his left arm, but certainly the referee's standing no-nonsense, and it's booked him within the first minute. I call him Psycho, and the, some of the fans are chanting that name. Angel, and the keeper, it might go in! South End have scored! Andy Sussex, 90 seconds gone! Drama at Roots Hall! A disappointing goal for Forrest to concede, and goalkeeper Crossley has stayed down, but Andy Sussex, the gamble that Barry Fry played before this game, has scored for Southend United. Well, it's a simple cross into the box there, it should have been dealt with by Forrest. Up gets uh, Brett Angel, and there's a clash there between Andy Sussex and, and Mark Crossley, and unfortunately the ball ricochets into the net. I think it was a fair challenge by Andy Sussex, the ball was there to be won. It's the sort of time when goalkeepers earn their money, they've got to be brave, they've got to make their ball their own, it was a 50-50 ball. Unfortunately, Mark Crossley didn't quite get to it, and Andy Sussex got the rebound and it went. What a start to the season, Ray, and uh, the only thing wrong from the South End fans' point of view was that it wasn't at their end of the ground. It came in front of the Forest fans, and as we've just seen there, Crossley has picked up a very nasty eye injury as a result of this, but... Even more harmful, I suspect, to Frank Clark's pride is the, side, is the fact that his side are a goal down. Yes, Mr. the last thing Frank would want. They've had an outstanding pre-season. They've virtually won every game they've played. And I know that I was speaking to Alan Hill before the game, and he was really looking forward to, to the start of the season. And uh, the last thing you want to do is, A, go a goal down this early, and B, to give you, you know, have your goalkeeper get a serious injury, which may possibly stop him from carrying on in the game. It's ironic that just before the game I was talking about the fact that we now have substitute goalkeepers in the Football League and it looks as though we're going to have Andy Marriott probably coming on to keep goal for Nottingham Forest for 88 minutes of the match. Yes, Andy Marriott, you know, he's, he's played a number of games in the first team, I think, and uh, although it would be a loss to not have Mark Crossley out there, I think Andy Marriott is more than capable of playing in, in this type of football. He's a former school excellence boy and uh, I know he's been pushing for his place most of the of last season anyway 
let's have another look at this goal what a dramatic start it is then the ball there played in it, it was a long long ball looping Sussex making the challenge he's obviously caught crossly badly and the amid the collision the ball just drifts on into the net I and mean, when you see it again that replay there it, it looks as though Crossley does get to the ball first but certainly it was fair enough for Andy Sussex to try and challenge for that ball in fact uh, Mark Crossley gets hold of it and before the challenge comes in it comes away from his body and that's when it goes on to Andy Sussex and into the net so uh, I don't think there was uh, you know it was just one of those accidental flashes which happens and uh, as I know myself being a goalkeeper you have to suffer these things sometimes so Andy Sussex he scored in the last match of last season and uh, he's now only one short of 50 career goals but uh, I wonder if it was a handball. I wonder if there's uh, an element of that in here. We're going to see it uh, again. Now then, there's Angel's header on. Now watch Sussex. Well, Frost is there, going for it it. there it is. Well, if it is, I think it's inadvertent. Yes, without a shadow. I mean, he was falling over there. There was nothing else he could do, and the ball just hit him on the hand and uh, went into the net. But there was, there was no way that Andy Sussex tried to knock that in with his hand. Well, the Southend supporters are happy enough, but there is Mark Crossley, who is bravely going to continue. I bet his head is ringing, that's for sure. And uh, talking about Southend not wanting to concede an early goal, it's Forrest who've done just that. Well, there's a long delay there, so there'll be about well, at least three minutes to be added on at the end of this first half. I saw Frank Clark standing, looking a very worried man on the touchline throughout the whole of that, and there he is, he'd be a manager. Brian Clough at home can uh, relax for once <laughs> and watch the cricket from what we hear. <laughs> and there again, Brett Angel will be pleased with his contribution to that goal. It's uh, a chance for, for him to impress today, and he was involved in the move. So he's posted a, a good advert for himself there. Well, he is a big danger in the air, Brett Angel, and certainly Forrest, even in their Premier League days, were always suspect to, to big strikers against him. They'd never really be able to cope with cross balls and high balls into the box, and without Carl Tyler today, who's got an injury, that's obviously a big handicap to them. I think, in a way, Forrest are missing the height of Carl Tyler today. He's out injured. In fact, he's not even done any pre-season training at all. Oh, there were stoppages in this game. That was another one, but now the throw-in is taken by Powell. Cracking start to the season anyway, just what the fans have been waiting for for the last uh, six weeks, is it, since the end of last season, that's all it seems. Well, I'm not sure it's what the Forest fans wanted, but certainly the South End fans are, can be more than happy with the start. It does let Forest know that they might be favourites to go up, but they're going to have to work for it. I remember seeing Derby County on the opening day of last season when they were pre-season favourites and they got humiliated at Peterborough. Well, that's right, Forest will find that they can't just play their, their pretty football all season in this division, they're going to have to battle sometimes. Rosario. They haven't settled, and there it's won by Payne. One of the former Barnet contingent brought here by Barry Fry. Well intercepted, that was well read by Cooper. And what's more, he found Glover. Well, Barry Fry has certainly got Southend uh, charged up for this. Chettle striding out from the back, a good turn by Rosario, but again it's well spotted by Bressington. Otto, first touch from him, Angel. And Southend just seem to be winning most of the 50-50 balls at the moment, and they're posing problems. Again, it's that little man Payne not giving them time to settle at all. Forest Freaker. Steve Stone looks as though he's going to be a regular in the Forest midfield this season. They think extremely highly of this young uh, player. He'll be 22 next week. Suffered in his early career from three broken legs, would you believe, as a teenager.
free kick is from Cooper. Rosario is a tall man and he's got a good header on here. Glover inside the south end penalty area. Danger to the south end goal for the first time. And still it's here as well. They just can't get it out. And then it's broken. And finally it's Payne once more who's glad to hack it out of flow. He looks too keen to receive the ball here. Little's not been giving many options. Now Little with the cross. They'll always look for the head of Rosario. This time it's won. And an easy collection for Paul Sanson. Ian Wone certainly doesn't get many goals with his head. it goes from Little, trying to seek out Glover. Offside he is. Well, the South End public have come to love Barry Fry in such a short space of time. In only nine games last season, he rescued them from relegation, and he's now known as the Pied Piper down here. Well, they're calling the tune at the moment. A goal in the lead, a chance here for Andy Ansar, whipped across, and this time it is kept at bay by Cooper. And an early break too, it fell kindly for Ian Wohn, he's got Rosario wide left, Wohn's gone a long way here. And broken the end to Rosario, Wohn queuing up, Stone, didn't get the loft on the chip he needed. Another play from the boot of Wohn. Good to see Neil Webb back in a Forest shirt, playing his 200th game for the club today. <laughs> this time it's Angel, who is anything but, as he came in on the back of Chettle. Well, Angel is, is causing problems every time the ball's anywhere around him, and we just saw a situation about a minute ago there where Pierce and Chettle were jumping into each other when uh, there was no other South End shirt around. This is a good position for Forrest. Free kick conceded by Pat Scully, that rugged former Arsenal defender. Now then, I wonder if Stuart Pearce can conjure one up with that famed left foot of his. Well, one thing's for sure, South End will have everybody behind the ball. Forrest have got five men behind it at the moment. It's Cooper alongside Pearce. Webb is lurking. On the obligatory ten yards, and it's amazing, you never ever get a wall that measures itself right. Now it looks to me as though Cooper might tee up Pierce. That would be the predictable thing. Cooper dallies. Keeper Samson clinging to his line by the left-hand upright. Well, they have the options, and it will be Pierce. and... Well, I hesitate to use the word woeful, but he certainly never hit that one at all. No, unfortunately, uh, Stuart there didn't make good contact with it. He's trying to get so much power into it. Here we see it now, and he comes right across the ball there, drags across it, and pulls it wide of Paul Sanson's left hand. And I would think Paul Sanson was happy, but I would think the wall was very happy as well there, because if Pierce hits you in the wall there, you certainly know about it. Very bright start here, we've had ten minutes of play. And here come Forrest, chances on now, Glover. He's got Stone, who's made a tremendous run to get up ahead of him, and that's an excellent tackle by Bressington. I said we've had ten minutes of play, in fact we've probably had about seven or eight, and that long stoppage for the injury to Crossley, meaning that will, will be considerable time to be added on at the end of this half. The first time Forrest have been here for 42 years. And they didn't make the start they would have wanted for. Across the seems to have recovered from that knock. Certainly instantly recognisable for the rest of the day. Rosario climbs well. So does Bressington. And this is Andy Edwards. Well met. 
by Chettel too there. Then Webb threads it through. Rosario might try and work an opening for himself. He wasn't sure whether to play it out to Black, I fancy. Otto. Good use of the outside of the boot in trying to bring an angel into it. And the persevering angel concedes the throw. It's clear that Forrest are going to use Rosario's height today as much as possible. Everything's aimed up to him. Well, you can see why Collingwell's been so successful for them in, in pre-season in terms of balls are played to Rosario and uh, Collingwell has got so much pace to get on the flick-ons. Well done by Powell, who got back to take the ball away from Glover's foot. Shouts for a free kick, not given, so Otto again. Jones and Sussex. It's a huge disappointment for the crowd here that Stan Collymore isn't playing. Often when a player leaves a club, he gets a rather ribald comments when he goes back, but I know that the fans here were planning to give him a terrific reception. They think a lot now of Stan Collymore, even though he's moved on. Yes, I mean, he scored so many goals last year for them. He helped to keep them in the division last year, and at one time they looked they would drift out of it. And obviously he worked a very, very good partnership with Brett Angel last, last year. And uh, it is a big disappointment for uh, the South End fans that he's not here, although maybe they'd probably like to see him here, but maybe sat in the stand not trying to score against them. Steve Stone, a tenacious worker for Forrest already today, seems to be involved in most things. The Forest do have a number of options in midfield, of course. Scott Gamble can't even get a place on the bench today, and he's in the Scotland squad. Pierce, plenty of time and space for him to romp down this leg. Angel pursuing him, but he's cut it in well for Wold in a thumping shot, which swerves a foot over the bar. Good move, instigated by Pierce, rounded off by Wold, but it didn't quite find the mark. No, he didn't quite find the mark, but that's the first time we managed to see Stuart Pearce in the attacking role that he loves to come marauding down this left-hand side. Here we go. And he looks up and he picks out Ian Wone superb. There he looks at him and puts it onto Wone's favourite left foot and he comes and lets it run across his body. And what, it's a foot over the bar, but that uh, was probably Forrest's best move. Powell covering, Webb chesting it down. And good skills all around the park there. Different skills too, and there's another one. Webb, lovely ball delivered with that outside of the boot, out towards Little. It's Forrest's throw, and Mr. Bowes has got a touch of Otto. So here is Glover. Real chance for Glover to uh, make a name for himself today. Wohn on the right foot. The foot wide this time. He's delivered one a foot over and one a foot wide now. Yes, as you can see from Ian Wohn's face there, he's, he's very, very disappointed not to have hit the target with that. He did everything right apart from actually sticking in the net. Here it comes into the box, he pulls off his marker, takes it superbly on his chest, and just pulls across it on his right foot. If that had been his left foot, I'm sure it would have been in the net, but all of a sudden, this last five minutes, Forrest has started to put one or two passes together and create things. And that must be a little disconcerting for Barry Fry. Forrest certainly have created three good openings there. Rosario has battled well to win that. Here's Kingsley Black. Useful ball in. Glover taking it down, hitting it in one. And unfortunately for Southend, Pressington got a foot in the way. And it's route one. And Angel has found Sussex. Oh, and Little playing a dodgy game there. It's not the area to try and be clever. So Otto delivers the ball long for Angel again. Does Little nearly played his side into trouble. So a tremendous little battle developing in midfield between Stone and Payne. Oh, that's coming away. Forrest warming to their task, but here comes Bressington. He's got a long way. He'll hit the shot. Straight at Crossley. 
But really encouraging that for Brestington and for Southampton to go so far. He's had a very positive start as Brestington. He's dealt with most things at the back very, very positively. And then he's come out from the back there and showed great confidence to come forward and try that shot from some 25, 30 yards. Thankfully for uh, Mark Crosley, it was straight at him and he's a good position. Here he is. Shrugs off uh, the red shirt so they're not there. Looks up, right foot drive, and there's Crossley in the ideal position to get hold of it. Long from Edwards. Sussex looking for the knock on. Angel, he's got Otto outside him. Spreads it wide. Now Otto against Littler. This is interesting. And the fullback's forced his man to run the ball dead. And that's much appreciated by the Forest fans, if not by the South End ones. I'm sure Barry Fry will be very disappointed there because it was a promising move when uh, Ricky Otto got down that left-hand side. There were three blue shirts in the penalty area rushing in there for the cross to come in and Ricky Otto delayed it and delayed it and eventually ran it out of play. So you can see Barry Fry there, he's encouraging and uh, I think he'll be disappointed the ball didn't come into the box then from Otto. Forest free kick, Rosario's getting a bit of stick down there from uh, Scully. It's going to be another interesting confrontation today between the two big men. Much as uh, Barry, uh, much as Frank Clark would have liked Rosario and Collymore to be the pairing today, he's ended up with Glover and Collymore. And still, he's got Gary Bull to call, and of course, the uh, summer signing from Barnet. He's injured. Now Webb flanked it in and easily headed away. Angels come charging from one side of the field to the other. You know, though. So much can happen in the space of 12 months in football. Just a year ago, Nottingham Forest began their new campaign with a win over Liverpool on the first day of the season and ended up going down. Yes, that's very, very true, and uh, I'm sure they'll be but they will definitely want to start with a win here this afternoon because it'll just give everybody around the club the support and just the boost that, to think, yes, we can do well in this division. But I know they've a battle on, they're a goal behind already. Scored in the second minute by Andy Sussex. And there is Sussex, and it really was an 11th-hour decision by Barry Fry to include him. All the vibes initially were to play young Gary Jones. £25,000 buy from Boston United. And then last night he decided to opt for experience and it played off with Sussex's goal. <laughs> Neat patterns here and the ball clipped off the heel of Scully, fortunately for South End. Forest have come to terms with life now, I think. I think they've come more to terms with it, but it is an interesting game, isn't it? Because it is two different styles. Glover, Rosario, Glover again. Brought down. <laughs> Scully the offender. And Lee Glover, who didn't expect to be playing at all today, has won a penalty for Nottingham Forest and given them the opportunity to equalise. It's been coming for a while from Forest, and here we see a nice interpass in there. Rosario lays it into Glover, and there's the tackle. A rash challenge there on the edge of the box. Certainly a penalty, and uh, you could tell from the reaction of the of the South End players that there was nothing to dispute there. And uh, here's a chance for Stuart Pearce to get himself up on the score sheet. The England captain looks to open his account for the season. The famous left foot, and it's 1-1. Driven low and hard. Sansom guessed right, he went the right way, but the Forest fans jubilant, their team's first goal in the first division. And he was calm as you like, Pierce. Perfect placement, having just missed with a free kick, of course, from just outside the area. He might have had that on his mind, but he didn't. He knew where he wanted to put the ball and did it right. And he's got far too much experience to worry about the one that was 10 minutes or so he dragged wide of the post. He just uh, kept his head down, knew what he was going to do with it, knew where he was going to put it, hit it very firmly, and although Sanson went the right way, there was no way he was going to be able to save it. It's South End 1, Nottingham Forest 1, and a rip-roaring start to the season at Roots Hall.
Yes, just the, just the start that uh, everybody wanted. You know, Southend went in front and uh, upset and ruffled Forest's feathers, but in the last 10 or 15 minutes, Forest have started to put it together and have looked on two or three occasions likely to get an equalising goal and are now, have now got that goal and uh, could go on from there now. It was very important for Forrest to get it too because here's Sussex now and this time Crossley comes to meet him head on and uh, no problem between the two of them. No, it was important for Forrest to get that goal because the longer the game had gone with them behind the more they'd have been worried. Yes, and the, and the more of a test of your confidence to keep playing the passing game which Forrest believe in. You know, it is, as I mentioned before, two totally different styles. Forrest are trying to build it through the middle of the field, and uh, South End, whenever they get the opportunity, are hitting it up to Angel or Sussex and trying to build from there. Chipped too long by Pierce that time. Some of the fans here booing the England captain, but uh, I don't think that will worry him. The first time Forrest have played outside the uh, top division, be it named the first division or the Premier League, since 1977. So they can be excused for taking time to settle to life. There is a difference between the way the, games are, the game is played at those levels. This free kick's about 30 to 35 yards out. And it would appear that Jones and Sussex are going to contrive something between them. And it's Sussex. And never had much hope of getting through, but Edwards can play it in. Important challenge by Woe. Forrest looks strong down the left with Pierce and Woe today. Now here's Black, he's seen very little of the ball so far, but for once they concentrate down the right and Little tries to use his pace. Otto has sold his goalkeeper short. And they were lucky to get away with that. Well, Paul Sanson did so well then, because when Ricky Otto sold the ball short, it could have been so easy for Paul Sanson to bring the, the Knox Forest player down there, but he, he timed his dive beautifully and just managed to push it away for a corner kick. But well, that was a terrible ball from Ricky Otto. It was. I mean, Otto is supposed to be one of the local favourites this season after his move from Orient, but his first two touches today have not been impressive. There's a long time to go. Corner kick and Sanson adds to his impressive work a moment ago with a solid catch. Starting his sixth season after his move from Millwall, Paul Sanson. Angel, beaten in the air by Cooper though. But Payne wins it in the air, and that must be a first. He's only about five feet five. <laughs> Cooper had to out, and uh, it was because Sussex's foot was raised that referee Bailey awarded that free kick. To Forrest. There's little Derek Payne. He's a real workaholic. They signed him from Barnet on a free during the summer. And I think he's destined to become a big favourite here because of his work rate. Well, he hasn't stopped from the first whistle, has he? He's put in pressure wherever he possibly can, winning balls that sometimes there's no right to win. But certainly he's the sort of player in the middle of the field you need these days where he's, he's aggressive, he's not the biggest in the world, but he's, he's very, very quick and uh, puts pressure on midfield players and uh, hopefully they give it away back to the blue shirts. That's a very much taller man, Robert Rosario, signed last season from Coventry City. Nearly 200 appearances now in league football for Norwich, Coventry and now uh, Forest. Just a reminder, Ray Clemens will later be naming the Ensley Man of the Match for us. A number of contenders already. 1-1 the score. Rosario again using his height well, that's just gone too far for Stone. The time is run well. The styles of the two sides are contrasting and they're making for an interesting encounter. 
pain again. Sussex did well to lunge out a boot. Renato has done likewise, but to the referee's displeasure. Certainly an interesting character there, Ricky Otto. Frank Clark, of course, uh, had him at Late Orient, and now as the manager of Nottingham Forest, he's trying to plan how to combat him. I'm sure Frank Clark uh, has not been able to wait for this day to get the wheels in motion again. Must be the most impossible job in football following Brian Clough. Series of good headers there, and now it falls to the boot of pain. And Jill, and Chettle puts it out. In fact, right out, it's gone over the stand and into the car park. Which uh, was housing a car boot sale this morning. It's also housing two balls now, that's the second one that's gone out. <laughs> Probably been sold already. You can gauge the weather from the crowd there. Lovely day here at South End in Essex. Otto was tying up a bootlace a moment ago, now he receives it and flights it across towards Angel, but that's too close to Crossley. Pierce looks so comfortable on the ball. Webb chipping it over the top, Stone, super run, must be a goal! What a magnificent piece of defending by Chris Powell. Stone was convinced he'd scored there. Webb, a delightful ball over the top. Stone taking it on the run, was convinced he'd scored, but for Powell there, that's one of the best interventions I think I've ever seen. A superb ball, though, from Neil Webb, and a good take from, from Stone. And I think if Stone, had, obviously, if he rolled it any other side but where he did, then Powell would have had no chance. But Great credit to Chris Powell there because he kept going, he didn't give up, he made an attempt to, to clear the ball from Alan Dutch his reward for it. Answer testing his pace against Pierce. Well, that really was so good, no praise high enough for Powell. And Webb, who delivered that excellent pass, doesn't do so this time. And so. just beginning to weave those pretty patterns which have been their trademark over the years. And Frank Clark will continue where Brian Clough left off on that score. Oh, that's neatly done from Rosario. Pierce, dangerous cross ball then. Again, it's Powell in the way. Jones simply took that from Rosario and then pelted it out to Otto down the left. Taking on Little. So far, Otto doesn't seem to have the confidence to go around the outside of Des Little. He hasn't had the confidence to go around the outside, and also when he has had opportunities to get cross balls, and he hasn't managed it so far. There is Des Little, number two for Forest, signed in the summer from Swansea City for £375,000. Swansea wants it £3 million. I think that was a bit ambitious, but he's a good little competitor. Frank Burroughs always did like a pound note there. And Southend are taking off Pat Scully, who conceded the penalty. That's not why he's coming off. He's had a groin injury and he missed three of the pre-season matches. He aggravated it during the midweek game against Cape Town Spurs. And so he has been replaced by Jonathan Hunt. Now here's Rosario, again he gets the flick through. Yeah, noticeable that what Southend have done with Scully going off is to switch Jonathan Hunter to the right-back position. 
there he is. Another interesting acquisition by Barry Fry. He was with him at Barnet, as most of these players seem to have been, and he was a winger there, but they're converting him into a full-back here at Southend. free kick right on the halfway line and uh, Cooper has to take it back into his own half so here it comes from Cooper towards Wood and Hunt's going to have to put it out of play for the corner which Kingsley Black will take from this side of the field Often takes them from the other side, but this one will be curled in by Black, the Irish international. There's Rosario going for it, and uh, Glover's claiming another one. Not been many corners in the game so far, but we have had two goals an early one for South End from Andy Sussex, the Stuart Pierce penalty in reply for Nottingham Forest. After a very nervy and uneasy start, Forrester coming right back into this game with their second corner, and Rosario didn't quite get the flick he was looking for. Jones winning it, but then it's won back by Webb. Oh, and then just in stretching there, Edwards might have diverted the ball to Glover. Edwards has gone to central defence, and that's going to be handball against Andy Sussex. <laughs> Ten minutes before half-time. Ray, what are your feelings about the first 35 minutes? Well, after the initial shock, I think the Forest have settled down well and looked the more accomplished side, as you would probably expect it from uh, them just coming out of the Premier Division as such. I think that, uh, you know, that Southend have got a slight problem now, having lost Pat Scully, that uh, Andy Edwards had to go to central defence, and uh, he doesn't look too comfortable there at the moment. It might take him a little while to, to actually uh, settle down there, but certainly this first five or ten minutes since he's been there, he hasn't looked too comfortable, and if Rosario gets up against him, that could cause Southend some major problems. That was a clear shooting chance for Otto, but he was a good 20-odd yards out, and it soared over the top. <laughs> Webb, and the ball well won by Keith Jones. Payne. And Black. Glover looking for Black again. He found him too. He was unable to take it in his stride, but Rosario has kept the momentum going for Forrest. That's one of those 50 50 balls that South End won. And then Forrest have got it back immediately. And Wohl had the chance to fight in the cross. Hunt was in the way. Another Forrest corner. And it's the third they've won in as many minutes. Well, you would expect them to look for the head of Rosario, who's by far the tallest man on the Forest side, and Brett Angel, not surprisingly. Southend's tallest man is marking Rosario. And that's exactly where it does go, and Rosario did get the flick, and it's kept out on the line by Powell this time. So exasperation once more for Nottingham Forest, and again it's Chris Powell who thwarts them. Cooper now. Now, now. Plenty of time for Hunt to clear, but Forrest then looks as though they might steal the lead. Let's have a look at this again. Well, it's Rosario on that near post again. Southend find it very, very difficult to cope with him. 
gets a little flick on, there it goes. Good header and Powell in perfect position to head it off the line. But somehow Southend are going to have to deal with Rosario better because he's getting far too, too many winning headers. Yes, it was Colin Cooper who got in the second, the header that was uh, knocked off the line by Powell. Still 1-1 one, one, though. Southend's turn to come it. Well, he is end to end at the moment, and Ansar tries to trick Pierce. Pierce has done well to get back. He's a great cross, Sussex, Angel, and the catch made comfortably enough in the end. Good work by Andy Ansar down the right. He certainly was. I was only thinking to myself before Andy Ansar has not done a lot in the game so far, but this is what he's capable of. Sees he can't go past Pierce, gets it into the near post. And really, that's half a chance there for Andy Sussex, and uh, Brett Angel gets a gets a head on it, but a comfortable save for Mark Crossley. Otto. This time it's played back. Crossley calmly lobbing it out. That worked out all right for him in the end. But it will be a South End United throw-in. Angel and Payne. Breaking for Otto. Powell skipping inside in and attacking guys now. We've certainly seen him do some good defensive work. Otto needs to get a good ball in. Tries to kid the defender. Does there's a header from Sussex and it's drifted wide just in front of Brett Angel, tantalizingly so. Well, I think Brett Angel wasn't expecting that ball to come, a, come across to the far post. A long last Ricky Otto gets a good ball in. Again, it's a half chance there for Randy Sussex. I think he tried to get it on target. Unfortunately, he didn't get a clean head on it. And he just caught Brett Angel on his heels a little bit on the back post. There we are. He's just, he'd have had to be real on his toes to have got to that ball, but uh, unfortunately he wasn't, and the chance went begging. Here he comes to Otto again, and that certainly was the most telling ball that Ricky Otto has played. I think he was the man that Frank Clark feared today, because he's extremely skillful, and he does normally play measured crosses in like that. Go for a corner from Little, it does. There's nothing Crossley can do other than smother the ball behind the line. There's Little's back header. The South End certainly have had very few corners in this game. So they're delighted to get one now, which their captain Jones is going to take in cohorts with uh, Derek Payne. Certainly didn't work out. Seemed a bit curious as well when they've got the height of Angel and Hunt up there. It also looked as though the Notts Forest player was never ten yards away from the ball when the ball was struck. Otto, I think he's warming to the task. Well, if I saw Ricky Otto in a pre-season game at Wickham uh, just over a week ago, and he did very little in the first half there, and then an outstanding second half, so who knows what's to come. Ray Clemens was referring to the fact that Forest had had an outstanding pre-season. They, in fact, beat Napoli and Slovan Bratislava. They lost to Atalanta over in Italy, but uh, generally, they were looking very, very impressive. And they've shown some nice touches here today. Hansen seeing most of, most of the ball now for the moment, and he has done the rest of the half. Hunt out towards Otto. Just kept in, to be fair to him, I think he knew what he was doing there, and he's got past his man. Good work, Otto! Oh, he should have teed up... Uh, well, I thought he should have teed up Payne, really. Tried to play the ball in rather too acutely, and it didn't work out, and now Wones made a terrific dash at field. He's on his own for the moment. Glover's going up the middle to try and get there. Good covering by Bressington. Very intelligent run by Wone, who'd spotted there was a gap up the right. Little. Level is an offside flag. Hey. 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 Hey.
header from Little. Glover will give chase, but it will just go out. So we're approaching half time, but remember there must be at least, I would have thought, three minutes to add on for that lengthy stoppage when Crossley was injured and had to have the head bandage applied. Space down the right now for Hunt, the substitute. Southend frantically trying to get men up inside the penalty box in front of him, and it was Pierce who'd gone across. Black has led the charge out and finds Rosario. Southend on the back foot, and Rosario stumbles and rather embarrassed, doesn't bother to pick himself up just yet. So it's answer against Pierce again. And some space created there for the cross to Sussex, and now Otto. It's very warm down on that pitch, and that might account for the pace slowing down at times. Here is Powell, and there are three men for Southend in the middle, and it was taken away by Cooper as it flew towards Sussex, lurking behind him. That was a very important header by Colin Cooper. I was talking to some of the Forest officials beforehand, and they've been really impressed with Colin Cooper in pre-season. He's a very good organiser, as the ball comes in here, there's Andy Sussex right behind him, and Colin Cooper just managed to flick it away there. closing moments of this half and uh, a pulsating half it's been at times some good football it's a similar ploy to the one they worked down the other side Otto it's a cross here for Ansar gets the shot in cleared again by Cooper to the forest half. Here comes the raiding Little again. Webb has got some space now. Pierce desperate to get up there as well, and Pierce goes on, but the little flick from Wilm didn't reach him. And left side given. Ian Wilm. Delightful touch as Ian Wong, hasn't he? He's got such a good left foot there. And uh, when Stuart Pearce started that run from deep, Ian Wong knew exactly what he was going to do the ball when the ball was played to him. He tried a delicate flick with the outside of his foot. Unfortunately, didn't quite get through there, but uh, a good football brain is Ian Wong. Glover. And Wong now. Rubs inside him. So it goes to Glover. Stone. Good football, this from Forrest. South end on the rack a little bit in the closing moments of this half. And here's a dangerous ball in. Rosario was coming for it. Goal kick is the verdict. And when the ball came in there, Rosario looked favourite to get it. And to be fair to Jonathan Hunt, he did it excellent job getting his body here it comes into the box the ball comes in looks like Rosario is going to get it and uh, Jonathan Hunt did well getting his body into Rosario and just putting him off enough so he couldn't direct his header on target and half time it is a very enjoyable half as well which started so promisingly for Southend United with Andy Sussex profiting after just two minutes when Crossley got in a bit of a tangle with his centre back Chettle and the ball bounced really off Sussex into the net but Forrest have shown their mettle and come right back into this and on 22 minutes a Stuart Pearce penalty got them back level in the game so half time it is here it's Southend United one Nottingham Forest one It's Southend 1, Nottingham Forest 1 at half-time at Roots Hall. And David, impressed with what you've seen so far? I thought Forest regained the composure very well after giving that uh, goal away. It must have put Frank Hart 
of Frank Clark's heart in his mouth to see his goalkeeper injured like that and to concede a goal uh, on your first game back in, uh, in the lower league. But um, Forest have looked composed. They've had three exceedingly good chances and they forced the issue most of the time. Let's have a look then at the highlights of the first half. No uh, quarter Arsenal given, as you say, and uh, what a start. Two minutes on the clock, Bailey. Yeah, last year I remember Collymore giving uh, Cooper a hard time in the air. There's Brett Angel gets the better of him here. And it was that, it was one straight, very direct ball. There you see it at the back post. Angel just gets above him as the ball is knocked across. Uh, Crossley possibly comes a little bit late for it, difficult for him. And um, that was a little bit of fortune for Southend. But Southend uh, had to backtrack here. Forrest coming back at them and yeah. a penalty. Lee Glover followed his ball very, very well there after taking it off of, um, off of uh, Rosario. and. Uh, he makes no mistake, the England captain, with a well-struck penalty. But he's it was a up, penalty. Yeah, yeah, he's fired up. He wants to get back into the big time. But um, it was a penalty. It was a rather rash tackle. I think it was Scully. And then Pierce again here. Yeah, as a for the nice, build up for a clever ball by Webb. Strangely enough, it was uh, Powell who made a magnificent clearance, who played Stone on side when he ran cleverly through. It was a lovely ball by Webb. That is Premiership quality, actually. Yes, yeah, it? it was first class. You saw Powell there run with Stone, and once the goalkeeper came and committed himself, uh, Powell did very well to get back onto the line. Off the line again by Powell? Yeah, off the line, doing his job. I mean, that's what he's there for if the keeper's beaten, but Rosario giving him a little bit of problem, back flicking that ball in the air. Hangs well, doesn't he? And that was a good leap by Cooper, and Powell perfectly positioned. How easy is it going to be for Nottingham Forest to adjust to life in the First Division? Well, I think you've seen there that the players have confidence and composure, born out of playing at the top level. They have three or four internationals in the side. They're not frightened to roll the ball around. They don't panic. They don't panic at the back when they're in trouble. To be fair, it was only in the last few minutes where South End began to get the ball wide and get crosses into the box, which may be a vulnerable feature of Forest. But the main differences in play? The, the, the... Not, not so compromise? much. I mean, John Helm in the commentary was referring there to a contrast in styles. I don't see that so much. While you've got people like Keith Jones and little Derek Payne in midfield, they will pass the ball south end. Um, I just felt that on the wide positions, particularly with Ansa and Otto, neither have had the uh, inclination or the pace to go beyond the fullbacks, Little and Pierce, who are going to be tough tackling competitors for Forrest this season at fullback. OK, David, well, it's nicely set up at the moment. 1-1, one, one. we'll have the second half from Roots Hall live after the break. Back to Roots Hall in a moment for the second half live of Southend against Nottingham Forest. Just a quick word, David, on what your old mate Barry Fry is likely to have said in the dressing room. He's going to put a few arrows on, a, on his board and he's going to be telling, I think, one of the midfield players, Jones or Payne, it's a little bit foreign to them, but one's got to get in the box there when they're crossing the ball. So they've got to try and give more harassment to Forrest. They're relying very much on Otto and Anser. They're not going beyond their full-backs. And on the other side, it's not so bad if your full-backs can get forward, but at the moment, Wone and Black are stopping any progress that Powell and Hunt now, who's come on a substitute, uh, would attempt to make. A quick word, you said 2-2, two -two, you stick by that? Oh, yes, most definitely now. <laughs> definitely. OK, let's find out then. The second half, live from Roots Hall, commentator again, John Helm. And it's perfectly set, too, at 1-1. One -one. Just looking around the two teams. Don't see any substitutions out there. Frank Clark's just come out to take his place on the Forest bench and he knows what it's all about now. Again, life as manager of Nottingham Forest. And with all due respect to Lake Norris, it's a different league for him here now. And here's one of his old charges at Forest back to Orient. And Otto has got past Little, but not past Black. Ray, we were just talking during the half-time there about the way the second half will develop, and you were saying about Barry Fry's sides, they never give in, do they? No, they never give in, and uh, although Forrest finished probably the stronger in the first half, I'm sure that uh, Barry will have wound up South End at half-time, and even if they were to go you know, a goal behind in the second half, Barry Fry's a sort of manager who will push even men, more men forward to try and get that goal back and win the game. And well, that's good for football. We want to see positive matches and this is definitely in that category. 
much doubt about that. And Barry Bailey wants a quick word with Derek Payne. Well, he only knows one way to play. He gives his all. Yeah, we gave a bit too much of it then. And Steve Stone. That's a, a little battle developing between those two. Cooper clips that free kick up. Well brought down by Powell. He's had a, an outstanding game with Chris Powell for South End in defence. Twice the saviour of his side. Good job he's playing for them. Uh, badly John Fashion, who trod on his big toad in a pre-season friendly, and he's only just recovering. And that was three weeks ago. <laughs> You're about right, actually. Well, the fans here have really enjoyed the start to the season at Roots Hall, albeit 24 hours late. And, uh, some here have a better viewing position than others. That's a perfect advantage position in the flats behind the goal, which Forrest are attacking in the second half. They've not paid. Stone, good ball winning by Keith Jones, the captain. Now it's Bressington, and now it's Otto. Well, the idea was good, he tried to transfer it quickly to Angel, but the danger is that Black can break for Forrest. Little on his outside, here he is. And Little's ball in, not well directed, easily cleared, but then acrobatically, Webb hooks the ball over to Wone, who is seen as being... Offside by the linesman on that far side. Just a reminder, Southend already have one substitute on. Jonathan Hunt in place of Pat Scully, who went off. He's uh, aggravated a groin injury. He also damaged his knee this afternoon as well, so not in great shape. Glover's taking the ball a long way. Black surrounded by a trio of blue shirts. But it will be a forest throw. About 3,000 fans have made the journey south from Nottingham. And they've enjoyed what they've seen so far after the second minute. Black trying to tease South End here, edge of the area. That's where they're dangerous. And they play those little passing games on the edge of the area. This is South End's longer ball up to Angel, who wins it as well. But the covering work by Chettle was effective. <laughs> Neatly done to bring Pierce racing up the middle. Out wide is Woe, and a good tackle. Jonathan Hunt, big day for him, he's only ever played down at third division level before, and non-league. Glover, Stone's in there, hustling for it, and fortunately for Southland, the ball broke kindly and Samson cleared it, onto the head of Angel. Sussex, nice little fate from him, and Otto, he's got time to think about this now, a little confronts him. And he's confused himself and still got the ball in. It was just over Sussex. <laughs> Up from Powell. Sussex towards Payne, whose challenge wins it. The back heel was well-intentioned by Ansar. Cooper should clear. back he didn't have a lot of the ball in the first half oh well was calling for it out wide left and when it does eventually reach him it's not going to do oh well was out there for a long time calling for the ball Webb and Pierce, the two England men. They've uh, lost it for a moment and then won't getting back, still complaining bitterly about not having received the pass when he was in so much space. Oh, 
That's a nice little flick, and it opens the way for Rosario to mount another forest attack. Well, and offside. Brought out twice already in this half. And Barry Fry's off the bench, urging his team on to greater efforts. Enormous optimist, enthusiast. He actually says Southend can win promotion to the Premier Division. Down here, they tend to want to believe him. Jones in very competitively. Payne and a free kick now for Southend. In a very healthy situation for them. Right on the edge of the forest area. Well, they don't have a Stuart Pearce to crack the ball through. So let's see what they do have. Jones is number four. Sussex is the player on his right. Southend scored an early goal in the first half. Can they repeat the trick in the second? It will be Sussex. Oh, it's just too high. He beat the wall and it flew a foot over the top. He tried one in the first half to hit the wall. This time he gets it around the wall, but unfortunately it's a foot over the top as well. But uh, if he gets another one, he might get it on target. He's getting closer each time. The pattern continues of Rosario winning so much ball in the air for Forrest. Do you feel that they've got to get a goal sometime from it? Interesting that Ricky Otto today is up against Des Little, the Nottingham Forest right back. Little played against Otto three times last season for Swansea City and did well against him every time, which is why Frank Clark chose him today. Here's the ball in, Glover's here. Brilliant save by Sanson. Great blocking save, but Black's here and thumped it over the top. Well, that was an outstanding stop from Paul Sanson. It certainly was, and yet again it was that man Rosario who won the ball in the air again and knocked the ball down there to uh, Lee Glover. And Lee Glover was maybe just a little bit, here we see the ball, into the box. Rosario up, good header down. And Lee Glover just possibly a little bit on his heels. He gets to the ball there. And maybe if we could have just knocked it a little bit wider at Paul Sands, he could have rolled him down to the net. But full credit to Paul Sands for spreading himself, being brave, and getting on, managed to block the ball. Rosario again and Stone, and once again, it's that man Powell for Southend who comes to their salvation. Stone had made such a good run through the middle, and now at the other end, straight away, it's Otto against Little again. Otto's won it as well, and fairly. Sussex wants it in the middle. Otto goes on, hits the shot in. Presley comes. Uh, he not hold on to it, he parried it, and Cooper put it out for the corner. That's the most exciting bit of wing play we've seen from Otto. That's right, he's been very frustrating in the first half, but this time you see he puts pressure onto Little, robs him there, Little trying to let it go out of play, didn't work. Now he comes in onto his right foot here, opens up an angle for himself, wallop. Across the car, handle it, and it's Stuart Pearce who clears the danger. Here's that corner. Pearce got it out, only as far as his opposite number three. Angel, Edwards is in here and hooks the ball over the top and out of the ground. Southend now creating chances, and to be fair, they didn't create many in the first half. No, Southend are creating chances because they're getting the ball into the Knotts Forest penalty area, which they weren't able to do, certainly, most of the first half. Just in this little spell here, they're getting balls into the box, and as we mentioned right at the start of the commentary, Forest have never been particularly good at defending headers in their own penalty area. And with the Brett Angel's height, he'll cause a lot of defence's problems. Rosario doesn't win it in the air, beaten by Bressington. And another little flick header, and this time Little is uh, seen to have held off Otto. The referee gives the free kick, and Otto has words with Little. The two of them have got plenty to say for themselves for the moment. The free kick's been taken. Powell for Sussex. Payne's making the run. 
well defended against by Cooper. Rome just about stayed onside, and so he takes on Hunt, beats Hunt as well. On goes Ian Lowell, hits the shot across. Sansom able to spread himself and make the stop. And yes, again, uh, good move by Forrest, and really when Wong hit the shot, uh, there was nothing else for him to do apart from hit it across the goalkeeper because the Forest players hadn't quite got up with him. And uh, he hit the target, forced Sanson to save, and that's all that was really the only option open to him. Southend having one of their brightest spells in the game over the last few minutes. Something for Frank Clark to ponder, that's for sure. Rosario is there again, here comes Stone! You might wonder how he missed that. And put on a plate, really, for him by the head of Robert Rosario. And I think there's a number of players in the Forest side holding their heads, can't believe they did miss that. In fact, Rosario was running back to the centre circle. Here we see it now. Ball arriving in the box, Rosario, and it really is a superb header, that. And Stone, his left foot, just has to hit the target, and uh, it really should have been the net. Steve Stone scored on his full debut for Nottingham Forest at Middlesbrough. Back in February, he's not scored since, and he's now South End looking for one. Otto's ball in, Crossley's in trouble, just over the head of Sussex, the little clears. We're having a bit of fun here this afternoon. Well, I think uh, the game certainly, early on in the season, I think games do open up in the second half because there's different levels of fitness and people start to make little mistakes. Webb to Rosario, edge of the area, skips over Edwards' his challenge. Rosario might try to find Stone again, and instead it's a corner off Pressington. Rosario is making more and more influence on this side as the game goes on, and uh, as you mentioned about ten minutes ago, that uh, it only seems a matter of time before one of his deft flicks is going to create a, a goal-scoring opportunity and the ball actually finishing in the back of the net. Corner is from Wold. A sequence of headers there. It all ended at the foot of Otto. Oh, dearie me, on the halfway line. A collision with Little. And I don't know what the referee's going to do about that. It was certainly a 50-50 ball, which the fullback had to go for. Ricky Otto, if he'd have gone past him, was on his way to goal. There will certainly be a card here for Little. I wonder what colour it's going to be. Well, Little did, he had to go for the ball, it was there to be won, but he just, just that fraction of a second late and he, and he caught Ricky off. So here we see the ball's bouncing, he goes for it, and uh, he's that little second late. And I think that's the right decision, that it is a yellow card. I think that uh, there was no maliciousness in that tackle at all, it was just a 50-50 ball, he just slightly mistimed it and unfortunately caught Ricky Otto. And Ricky Otto is on his feet now, there's no problem with him either, so it's, uh, I think that's the right decision from where the free kick actually occurred. Certainly an interesting confrontation between Otto and Little in the second half, as we thought it would be, and so Little booked on his debut. The amazing thing is that before the game in the warm-up, the two of them were having a chat down here in front of the commentary position, so they're the best of friends. I think they still will be, to be fair, uh, Ray. the way the game has gone and they're bound to come into conflict at some stage there's Rosario bobbing up on the left now oh it's a clever chip over the top and they're all on side whoa St stone again was in the middle and you feel that at some stage he's bound to get one on target Forest throw in south end stretched goes well, bundle up it by Hunt, that's a free kick. And you do feel that Southend are uh, uh, being overstretched, they're hanging on. They are hanging on at the moment, yes. Forrest are making more and more inroads into the Southend penalty area, into the penalty box. And it's just that final ball or that final strike on target that's not quite happened for them yet. The entertainment is rich. Could be next week as well when Southend go to Millwall. That's another game you can see in the London area. Wone with that free kick. Cooper got up for it, but the ball was just deflected as he went in. 
and a corner is the verdict. You can see the strain. Can they take the strain? Black. Oh, this time it's not really well directed. Never got anywhere near Rosario. Ricky Otto is enjoying himself now, he's beginning to tease. Angels header, and then off Sussex, here's Otto. That time it was Chetel who came across, alert to the danger. from Bressington towards Sussex and up towards us from Chettle. Well, I actually managed a header there, would you believe it? The ball came down on top of me. I'm still alive. I'm talking. Robert Rosario enjoyed it, I can tell you. I nearly nodded it to you, Ray. I'm sure you it wasn't a very good header, I might tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Never was. <laughs> Breaks for power. On he goes. The movement up ahead of him, but instead intelligently he brings in Hunt. And South End are five men inside the forest penalty area. And that's a really disappointing delivery of the cross, bearing in mind that they were all up there. Yes, it was really. South End have not had enough possession of the ball to actually, when they get in that last third of the field, to waste balls like that. They've got to make quality crosses to give the likes of Andy Sussex and, and Brett Angel a chance to get headers on target. But uh, that really was a wasted cross and uh, one that Barry Fry again will not be happy with. 1 1 the score. South End United 1, Forest 1. Cooper has been outstanding at the heart of the Forest defence heading out, Stone heading on. And he's onside, Stone's onside, Wones up the middle calling for it, he's onside as well, surely now, terrific stop again by Sansom and the Forest players cannot believe it. Southend were looking for an offside, it wasn't forthcoming, Wone really should have scored. Well, there was no way that that was an offside decision. It was a great run there from Stone from the middle of the field. And when the ball was eventually played to Wohn, I think everybody in the stadium would have backed to him, Wohn sticking it in the net. But Paul Sampson came at him so quickly and spread himself, and uh, as Wohn tried to tuck it in the corner, nice, Sampson tried to push it away. Here comes Stone inside that area again, and this time the shot is blocked by the desperate Edwards. And these are desperate times for Southend. Well, Southend definitely hanging on for dear life now. But, uh, not as far as they've taken total control of the game now. Pierce. They really should be home and dry by now. Pierce might win a corner. No, it's dribbled through to Sansom. And again, Southend come away on stage. Well, if Southend were to nick this one, Forrest really would kick themselves, because they've had all the chances. Oh, yes, that uh, shell of a doubt. So, uh, Forrest, apart from the initial 15, 20 minutes of the, of the first half, have been the better side and showed most of the uh, class play in this game. And uh, although Southend have battled hard, as all Barry Fry sides do, they've not been able to cope with the uh, Forrest movement. And here's more movement involving Stone again. Rosario calling for it and getting it wide on the left. Hunt coming to him. It's a bit of a tussle. And, uh, South End emerge with the ball and with the free kick. It's fair to say Rosario's happier when the ball's in the air. Yes, it's not uh, the strongest part of his game, running at people um, with the ball at his feet. But uh, what he has done well today is he's obviously his, his work in the air has been superb, but he's also helped play up well around the box, and Forest players have been able to play nice one-twos off him. One thing you do wonder is if Forrest might well have sorted them a victory out uh, by now. 
if Stan Collymore had been playing. You'd have fancied him to have taken one or two of those chances. But it's still 1-1. Black against Chris Powell, who's dealt effectively with most things today. It's nicely done. A little dummy run by a little open the way for Black's shot here, but it's a tepid one. Sussex, he wasn't sure where that was. Taken down very well by Rosario, and then he has his ankle tapped by Hunt. So it's another Nottingham Forest free kick, and that will enable Southend to make a change. Barry Fry has decided that uh, enough is enough and takes off Andy Sussex. And, uh, oh no, it's Andy Ansar who's gone now. He was going to take off Andy Sussex, I think, but uh, Andy Ansar has gone and been replaced by the other substitute. Gary Jones. Sansomer hasn't put a foot wrong really today. Well, Sanson's had an excellent game. He's, uh, everything that's been thrown at him, he's dealt with very, very comfortably. He's only been beat by a penalty and has made a couple of exceptional saves. Well, that's little is having a, a very eventful second half. He's been booked and now. Uh, He's been felled. And they don't know what earth he's on for the moment. He felt the full force of that. It's one of those unfortunate things that happen in football. No complaints. All right, just gives us time for a moment to ponder on the game as a whole. And really, on the balance of play, Forrest should be home and dry, shouldn't they? Yes, they should be home and dry, but they're not, and that's the great thing about this game, that uh, Forrest have been the better side. But Barry Fry's team have kept battling, they've had a little bit of luck, Paul Sampson's made a couple of exciting saves, and they're still in the game, and anything can happen in this last part of the game, which all of a sudden, from a set-piece situation, or a breakaway, Southend could possibly nick it. Still plenty of time for anybody to win the Man of the Match award as well. by Bressington, the ball laid up to Angel, and then they'll always try and get onto the way down this left-hand side, and Crossley came for it, unfortunately for him, the ricochet carried it into the path of Cooper, one of his colleagues, and now, straight away, here's Rosario against Bressington, Rosario goes on, and amazingly, the goalkeeper at the other end, Sanson had to come and take the ball off the foot of Rosario, so it's all happening here, oh, it's going to happen again now, Jones inside the area, Cooper, outstanding once more. Yes, Cooper's, uh, um, I mentioned him earlier on in the commentary, he is uh, one they think very, very highly of at Forest, and he's held the Forest side together when they've been put under pressure. Certainly they are missing Carl Tyler at the back, but uh, you can imagine when Carl Tyler comes back alongside Colin Cooper that uh, they will have a formidable back to. New bandages required. Fair enough, of course, for play to be stopped for this sort of treatment where there's blood involved. You have to be careful. Nothing to be more careful about than a head injury. You've got one or two of those in your time, Ray. Unfortunately, it goes to the territory of being a goalkeeper, getting one or two knocks around the head. Crossley's done well to carry on, and, you know, I suppose goalkeepers always have it in their minds if they're out of the team, they lose their place, and it takes some getting back. You'll want to have carried on today. Yes, I think uh, that Mark Crossley as well is very, very aware that he wants to do well this season because there were a few fingers that were pointed at him with some of the results that happened in the Premier Division. 
and he'll want to do really well to help Forrest get back into the, that top league this year, so he'll want to start and do well. Are you at all surprised they haven't brought Marriott on? No, I'm not at all, really, because, uh, you know, I say goalkeepers are mad, and uh, <laughs> he's got a head wound, but he doesn't have to head the ball, and as long as he's comfortable and he's not got blurred vision as such, and only he can be honest about that, whether he has or not, then uh, he'll be comfortable to play on. It'll be a little uncomfortable, he'll have a headache tonight, but if Forrest win, he won't worry about it too much. Let's see if either side can win the match now. It's South End United 1, Nottingham Forest 1. Both goals in the opening 20-odd minutes, and here's another one for Glover to go for. Sansom again, total credit to him, spotted it. It's been a very open and attractive match, even though we've had no goals as yet in the second half. Webb will try and contrive one for Forrest. Kingsley Black hounded out of it. And that was just a little short. Certainly noticeable that Frank Clark has not made any changes to his personnel yet. So he must be happy with the way the pattern of the game is evolving. He's got Brian Laws and Lee Harvey on the bench with him today. And they're having to wait their turn. Pierce, free kick for Forrest, up to inevitably Rosario. He must be one of the contenders for another match. Along with Sans of his Glover inside the area, climbing all over his opponent. Free kick given. Cooper's another one on the Forest side. Powell's played well for South End. So many contenders. Is that trying to influence me at all here, John? Not at all, Ray. I wouldn't do that. I know you've gone for Pat Scully. <laughs> Cooper. Fair to say, Southend uh, choking apart. I actually missed Scully since he, since he went off with his height in the centre of defence there. Yes, they've never really uh, settled down since Andy Edwards has gone into the centre there with Bressington. Lovely work from Payne. He does do well in those situations. Keeps them ticking along. Jones, the crowd roaring to warn him that Glover was behind him. Almost like pantomime behind you. Breaks for Keith Jones to Andy Sussex, and Sussex lets one fly. He thought he was coming off a few minutes ago, and he's still got the opportunity to steal the game. And now Forrest, funnily enough, Frank Clark is to make a change, and it will be Wone who comes off. And it... There he goes, Ian Wone. And Lee Harvey is the substitute, although he's wearing 12. Uh, I'll show you this is Lee Harvey and not Brian Laws. Originally, we had the substitute numbers given the other way around, but that's Lee Harvey, former Leighton Orient player. Ball breaking here for Des Little. Little. Floating it up, it's beyond Rosario, and it's beyond Harvey as well. Here is Harvey. Plenty of talent. Pierce. Getting it onto his left foot still. And a crunching tackle on him by Hunt, so south end break. I don't think that's going to be effective enough. Well won by Edwards. Harvey to give chase. And Edwards doing a solid job as deputy for Scully. Lee Harvey's interesting character there. He was a regular member of the Lake Norian side two or three years ago, scored a spectacular winning goal for them. 
in the promotion playoff match against Wrexham, but he's had a lot of injury problems. Here's a chance now, Rosario checks it, knocks it back for Webb, and the ball somehow found its way away out of the area, thanks to Andy Sussex. And again, it's Otto against Little. Well, I think if uh, Robert Rosario sees that again after in a replay situation, you'll wonder why on earth he didn't hit the ball when it came to his left foot, because uh, certainly the opportunity when the ball was played in, there was space for him to just help it towards the net with his left foot, and he decided to take a second touch, and uh, the opportunity had then gone. Neat work initially from Stone, and then from Rosario, who sold that dummy, and it opens up the way for Harvey to have a tilt on the left. Uh, neatly played, and good work by Black to get in here as well. As again, look, Southend closed the door. And then Hunt gives it away. Can't afford to do that. The flick on here sees Rosario offside. Well, the time's ticking by here, and we keep saying that Forest will go on and win this game, but they haven't as yet, and uh, you know, the chances are coming less and less than this last five minutes, and you just wonder, is that going to be their day? And, uh, this time it's Pierce who has to come and intervene with Otto going through to try and get on the end of Angel's pass, which was a good one, and that was an impressive movement by Southend. That's probably the best movement they've put together in this second half, to be fair. There was three or four passes there with a good incisive through ball, which uh, took a, a, a good interception by Stuart Pearce reading it, coming over from the left-back position. Frostley tends his net. Payne with the corner for Southend United. 1-1 the score. Both sides looking for a winner in these closing ten minutes. Really perfect playing conditions today, which should have suited Forest's passing style, and has to a large extent. They've certainly created openings, and yet the only one they've taken has been from a penalty. But only fair to point out again that they are without Stan Collymore and Gary Bull, their two signings during the summer. Time is on Powell's side now. Plenty of people up ahead of him, and he feeds Otto in down that left touch line. He'll keep this one in. Oh, came over towards the substitute Jones. As you see, he was cleared well inside the south end half. The pace remains good despite the warm atmosphere. Payne has made the break at the middle. Payne onside. Still Derek Payne. Surely. How did they not score there? Derek Payne and Brett Angel onside him. Barry Fry holds his head in disbelief. That would have had Fry doing the famous jig down the touchline. Well, this could go as one of the misses of the season. Derek Payne has worked so tirelessly in the middle of the field, goes around cross, he's got to roll it in, slips, he can still roll it across, and he rolls it right across the face of the ball. I mean, th this early in the season, that could go down as the miss of the season. He does everything right there. Now he can he roll it in the net. No, looks up, slips, he can still roll it in. And he rolls it across the face. Unbelievable. I wonder if he was spoilt for options there by seeing Brett Angel alongside him. Well, the crowd thought they were on a winner then. Barry Fry certainly did. Well, when he went round Crossley, I don't think there's anybody in the stadium who wouldn't have backed him to score. Now both sides can kick themselves for missing chances. Forest have had the most, Southend have had the best. And there's that fella playing again, he doesn't let it worry him. And they've emerged with the ball, and here goes Andy Sussex up the middle. Angels alongside him. Sussex will try his luck, the thrilling stop. Otto slices it. And now, suddenly, the complexion has changed yet again, and it's Forest who are just hanging on. That's the great thing about this game of football, isn't it? I mean, all of this second half, Forest have been in control. They look, it's only a matter of time before they, they get their noses in front. And then all of a sudden, the game turns right around. And uh, in the space of a minute, then 
then Southend had two wonderful opportunities, one which is forced a very good save from Mark Fosley, and uh, one miss that will be talked about for a long, long time. Down at the other end, Glover denied by Edwards. Fast and furious now, a few tired legs out there as well on the opening weekend of the season. Jones, they're headed down, here's Brett Angel. This is Keith Jones, Southend looking for the winner. Gary Jones, could he be a hero? Just too far in front of Angel. Crossley makes another stop. Yes, some good movement. Gary Jones managed to stay on side there, run right along the face. Little from the face of the back four. Good cross in, but just too close to Mark Crossley. And uh, Mark Crossley kept his eye on the ball, didn't look at Brett Angel running in, and made a comfortable catch. Well, it really is amazing, it's only 1-1. One, one. and a growing in confidence, you can see that. Here is Payne, he's never stopped. He goes down under the challenge of Chettle, free kick, south end. And I think that Forrest's response will be to bring on Brian Laws just for these closing moments. They haven't actually held up the card yet, but Laws has stripped off and is ready for action. We're ready for this south end free kick. Southend would seize as such a famous victory if they could beat Nottingham Forest. The promotion favourites, remember. Jones flighting it in, and Crossley coming off his line, showing there's no damage to him. There could have been after that awful collision in the second minute when Southend went in front. The scars of battle. going out of play does enable Forrest to make that substitution that I was inferring would happen here's Brian Laws and it's Lee Glover who makes way for him but Glover won the penalty for Forrest which got them back in the game yes he's worked very hard up the front there and uh, as you say managed to get the penalty with a good movement with him and Rosario but uh, I would think Frank Clark now looking he's in this last 10 minutes of the game now and uh, He'll have what to uh, hold on to what they've got, and if they can nick a win from somewhere, then accept it. But uh, I think he'll settle for one all at the moment. They'll have a free kick. Can either side yet win this one? Three points makes such a difference. Coming for Rosario. Goal kick. kick a couple of minutes to go and Pierce and the goalkeeper has to come for this center I think he handled that outside his area did he well the referee has yes he's gonna have words with Paul Sansom here this is trouble for the South End goalkeeper it was one of those situations where the ball was delicately hovering around the edge of the area. Sansom knew he had to do something. A referee Bailey has gone across to have words. It's sure right on the line there, isn't it? I mean, Paul Sansom would be harshly dealt with if uh, the referee did do anything with him in terms of the yellow or red cards. It looked like the ball was actually on the line, but uh, unless you're actually... <laughs> well, he's bringing the card out now, it's a, a little bit of a shame because it looked to me as though it was right on the line but uh, the linesman over that far side has deemed to say that it was actually outside the box so unfortunately Paul Sanson is going to get to hopefully no more than the yellow card and that's all it is. I think the referee has actually had a bit of sympathy for him in a way I saw them all sharing a joke there before he produced the card so 
for a relief, Paul Sampson. Yes, here's a free kick then for Nottingham Forest. Now then, we haven't really seen Pierce hit one fully yet today. Is this the moment for him? Can he get it through, or will it be a chip? Well, it's swept in low and swept out just as easily. And Southend lead the charge, and Jones comes tearing up the middle. Little Crossley in, Crossley's boot does the job. Well, Ray, I'm sure I haven't swayed you in your verdict, but now is the time to name your man of the match. Well, there's been some very, very good performances out there from both sides, hasn't there? I think that it was good to see Stuart Pearce back out there, and he's had a good game. I think that uh, Cooper's played well, and Rosario. But the man I've picked is Chris Powell of Southend. Chris Powell of Southend left back, who made two critical interceptions in the first half, and a thoroughly deserving winner. I think he's just heard the news. Big grin on his face there, but it's Forrest who have the attacking options here in the closing stages. Throw into them. Rosario, this is danger to South End. Rosario's back heel. Sussex was there. Otto tricks his man neatly. Away he goes up the middle, and then the ricochet carries it right into the heart of the South End penalty area. Free kick given. Rosario offside. So little time left. South End's turn to look to see if they can nick the points. I think both sides will settle for one one now. I would say so, yes. There's some very, very tired players out there, and it always happens in the first two or three games of the season. No matter how much pre-season training you've done, these first few games just get that extra bit of fitness back into you, and uh, the last ten minutes of these first few games is, is one where it hurts a lot, and you can see one or two players' legs are now going. And both will be happy to get off the mark with their first point of the season, but here comes Kingsley Black. They've got bodies around him. They're very, very tired, those players down there now. Not Bressington, he won it from Stone. Oh, and clipped Otto's ankle as he looked to make tracks. Webb, first time intuitive ball out to Lee Harvey, the substitute. Offside. Brian Laws. No doubt in the mind of Mr. Crick, the linesman over on that far side. Closing seconds of the game at Roots Hall, Southend United 1, Nottingham Forest 1. <laughs> certainly a lively workout for both sides. Yes, certainly, I would think that uh, Forest are, are relatively happy in terms of they've got back in the game from losing that early goal. They've played some good football, and let's not forget that possibly you know, they're minus their number one strike force, and certainly Stan Collymore. Uh, and maybe Bull would come into that as well. So, uh, we'd, uh, you know, they have two players who can come into the side and score goals for them, and that's what cost them their position in the Premier League last year, is that they didn't score enough goals. That's right, once Teddy Sheringham had gone to Tottenham, there seemed to be nobody to take his mantle. But with Stan Collymore and Gary Bull, certainly that shouldn't be a problem for Frank Clark this season. No, I would think not, that's why he's bought them, that's the, the part of the team that he felt that uh, needed strengthening, and uh, he's got two players who are capable of scoring a lot of goals for them, and uh, I'm sure he'll be quite pleased to come out of this now. Although they've dominated the game, and really they should have won it with the opportunities they had. They haven't, um, he's now got to settle for this point, and I would think Barry Fry as well will be quite happy to come out um, with a point as well from the way that they've at times been outplayed, but you certainly can never ever say that that uh, South End have given up uh, their enthusiasm and their effort. Absolutely not. They've contrived chances in this half as well. They could have won it. Now Laws for Forrest. Poor ball in. Bressington knocks it out to Payne. And that uh, is it. It ends all square, and that's probably about right. There are smiles on both sides. I think they're happy just to come through this one. They both garner their first points of the season.
Forrest having got a goal behind in only two minutes when Mark Crossley there was badly injured in the collision with Andy Sussex, who got the credit for the score. There is Andy Sussex. Uh, the gamble paid off in playing him, Barry Fry's gamble. But Forrest came back and a penalty by Stuart Pearce after Lee Glover had been brought down by Pat Scully ended 1-1. And we can now hear from the man who got that equaliser, Stuart Pearce. Stuart, one apiece. Are you satisfied with that? Um, I thought we had enough chances maybe to win the game. Um, so we'd have liked to come away with a win. But I suppose at the end of the day, it was an open game. Fair result, yeah. And you're on the score sheet yourself? Yeah, it made a change scoring penalties, but... I'd rather us get two, but that's the way it goes. And what about on a wider basis, looking at uh, looking ahead to the England form, how's your fitness? Really, I can't look no further ahead than our next game. I'm just happy to be on a pitch again playing football. Um, if I can improve a little bit, get my form, get my fitness, I'll be happy. Good. Thanks very much, Stuart. Thank you. Well, again, it finished. Southend 1, Nottingham Forest 1 at Roots Hall. The goals from Andy Sussex in the second minute for Southend and then Stuart Pearce getting the equaliser from the penalty spot. Mr Pearce said he thought it was a fair result. Uh, how about yourself, Mr Pearce? Oh, entertaining score draw. I thought Forest were wasteful. They got some good chances. Ran well from midfield. Stone. Webb passed well. And I thought Southend were gritty. I think we can illustrate now the wastefulness because uh, certainly Forest had their fair share of chances. This is second half now, and uh, Rosario certainly setting them up nicely. Yeah, he jumps well, doesn't he? Holds his jump well. Glover just couldn't get round that ball. Sansom did well to block. Um, you know, it was, a, it was a good opportunity. Here was South End Otto striding past Little when he was taking chances, and he cuts in on his right foot and, and hits one. And uh, the goalkeeper does well there to parry. I thought the goalkeeper, considering his injury early on, did well to, to keep playing. Quite amazing, kept, really, yeah. Yeah, he kept a solid goal. Here's Big Rosario again. Yeah. You see, you have to remember, Scully went off, and that was important. Uh, and, you know, when you consider that Pryor played last season with Scully, here's a, and yet another chance. That was a real great chance of Wone, completely free. And, of course, here's that incredible fine ball by Jonathan Hunt, the two Barnet boys. Excellent play by Little Payne. He went past the goalkeeper perfectly and he just lost his stride as he reached the byline. In his wisdom afterwards, he'll reflect that he might have squared it across and it would have been a safer goal. But he tried to put it in himself and he just got his legs too far apart there as he um, made a mess of it. But, One uh, more time just to make it Yeah, happy. it's a great opportunity. Um, he's done well, Little Payne. He's a, a little worker. He's a very busy bee. He's got a lovely left foot. But uh, unfortunately when he needed it most of all on the day, couldn't do it. You fancied they could have nicked it, and indeed they could have done. Well, you, there's always a chance. If, you, if you're a manager of a side that is scorning chances, as Frank Clark was sitting there for 25 minutes of that second half, there's always a fear that the other team might ride their luck and go and uh, get the victory. And Southend finished strongly. Just a word about the uh, Southend defenders, because, as you say, Pat Scully went off. They've lost Spencer prior to Norwich. Yeah, I mean, it was interesting. The cutting thrust that Forrest hope will take them back into the Premiership, which is Bull and Colin Moore, were missing. And the reliable rock of South End last year was Pryor, who's with Norwich now, of course, and Scully, who hasn't been fit and had to go off with a groin injury. So, in a way, you have to say that South End, with the problems they had there, did well to reorganise at the back. Jonathan Hunt is normally a forward player. He's played at full-back and, and done adequately. And uh, they've reorganised at the back. Bressington, a new signing. Um, so, they've coped quite well, South End. OK, thanks, David. Your turn next, because still to come, the good news and the bad news of the goodies and the bad guys from Luton, and indeed the competition to win some light reading matter, the new football yearbook. That's coming up after the break. Hello again. Plenty left as we move into extra time. Luton and Watford, for instance, still to come. But first, uh, a quick check on what's happening at Carrow Road. Manchester United, the champions, are playing Norwich, of course. The half-time score there, Norwich City nil, Manchester United 1. Ryan Giggs, who else? The scorer in the first half. 
By the way, you can see highlights from that game here on Anglia in the news at six o'clock, along with highlights of yesterday's matches in the third division involving Northampton and Colchester. Would we forget them? Of course not. OK, time now for a quick competition and your chance to win a copy of this, the Rothmans Football Yearbook. Just out, £16.99 if you want to buy it. Absolutely free if you want to try and win it. All you've got to do is answer a reasonably simple competition. There is, of course, a lot of European football coming up on ITV this season. So, what about the match we're now about to show you? It's a game played this weekend. We want you to tell us which country the game was played in. As I say, a league match. You'll do well to recognise the teams, but you're going to have to because we need to know which country this took place in. So that game took place this weekend, but which country was it played in? Here's the address to go for, Anglia Sport Special Competition, Anglia House, Norwich NR1 3JG. Just run you by that again. Anglia Television, Norwich NR1 3JG, and the winners' names will be here on Anglia News next Friday. European football, David. Norwich City make their first little uh, excursion against Vitesse Arnhem. British teams equipped, well equipped, or English teams well equipped for European football? Well, I think they're well equipped, yes. Um, I think we were very disappointed with really what happened last year with Leeds and Manchester. But after so many years out, possibly um, we realised that we've got some picking up to do. But I would have thought Norwich are fully capable of uh, getting through their first games with Arnhem. Um, I think they were the fourth side in the Dutch league. And I'm sure that Norwich have the staff and the squad to take that one. OK, we shall see. As I say, Norwich are in fact uh, being beaten at the moment. 1-0 they, they trail uh, at the moment against Manchester United. Right then, back to the action. The first division, of course, is a tough battleground. But uh, in the early 80s, it was a happy hunting ground for both Luton Town and Watford. They were promoted together in the 81-82 uh, season, I believe it was. That's correct. And we've compiled a little flashback, a little trip down uh, memory lane. If you could take us through some of the, uh, the fresh faces we can see here. What was it like then? Well, it was a good side. I mean, the, the, the club was ambitious. The difference then was the, pl the club was able to hold on to its uh, players that were progressing. For example, this clip in the dressing room, the Brian Steen and Ricky Hill, who both came from uh, backgrounds not uh, very high up, one from Edgware Town, one from school, both went on to play for England. And, uh, you know, the pleasure now is that several of them are managing. Richard Money's at Scunthorpe, Brian Horton's at Oxford with David Moss, Lil Ficillo's managing Peterborough. Radian teaches manage Real Madrid, which is tremendous. And of course, you know, other players. Um, Mr. Ficillo? Mr. Ficillo, yes. He's um, doing do a good job. Um, just with his chairman and other ex Lutonian, Chris Turner. David Moss was a very, very fine winger, one of the finest wingers I've ever worked with. He could place a ball on a sixpence. There you see him hitting the stanchion for fun from a penalty. And, um, you know, the, the players had the confidence to pass the ball. They, they, They'd been twice almost successful. They had the heartbreak of missing promotion the year before they finally achieved it. Here you see some telepathy between Ricky Hill and Brian Steen. Brilliant play by Steen. Another goal against the old enemy, Watford. We, we invariably did beat Watford. But Brian Horton there you see celebrating that goal. He was the catalyst. The year before he wasn't with us and the final year we got up, he was the one that came and capped in the side and brought it all together. We had a marvellous centre-back too called Mal Donaghy who... Uh, Still going strong. Well, he must be getting on for 40. He's fantastic. <laughs> There's a great cross, great header by Steen. I think Steve Sherwood, the unlucky goalkeeper for Watford. But you were telling us, David, you, you're now in a new era where you're building a team. This team also took a little bit of building, didn't it? Yes, it did. It took, uh, well, um, three or four years. They'd gone close twice. It was an excellent side. And of course, after this, the leading goal scorer, Steve White, still playing at uh, Swindon Town. Immediately we won this championship, he left after scoring something like 17 or 20 goals and Paul Walsh came and we started manoeuvring and using the transfer system. Now it's a little bit more difficult for us to use the transfer system. We can still sell, we'll always be able to sell because we give young players a chance at Luton. But is there a Ricky Hill or a Brian Steen in the wings at Luton right now? I think we've got players in the wings but they need games and they need experience and the only way they can gain that experience is the hard way. We have to be patient, we have to give them time. 
They seem quite a responsive group, don't they? It seem as though they're listening. It must have been... <laughs> I must have told them the camera was coming that day. <laughs> we'll have to do it again for you. OK, David, enough nostalgia. Let's now have a look at the modern generation of players at Kenilworth Road. Luton Town versus Watford, the big local derby to kick off the season. And our commentator there is Jerry Harrison. A new season, a fresh start, particularly for Jürgen Sommer, the American goalkeeper who starts his first league game for Luton. The departure of Alex Chamberlain, the sale of leading scorer Phil Gray, familiar tales of commercial expediency at Kenilworth Road. But there is talent here in this Luton team wearing squad numbers for the first time. Very little backup, though, if things go wrong. But this is a golden opportunity for youngsters like Scott Oakes and Martin Williams. And they'll need help from the experienced Kerry Dixon, starting a new loan spell from Southampton. Watford, under new manager Glenn Roder, also have an inexperienced goalkeeper, Simon Shepherd, because of injury to Perry Suckling. Plenty of good young players here. The oldest, 28. The big clubs are eyeing, eyeing number three, Jason Drysdale. But the immediate priority, Glenn Roder says, is to tighten up in defence, which conceded 71 goals last season. And then worry about getting Ken Charlery, the ex-Peterborough hero, the ammunition up front. And he knows that with Paul Furlong alongside him, they're not short of potential goal scorers here. So the big local derby to start with here at Kenilworth Road. Both sides will benefit enormously from a good start. Luton wondering who's going to score the goals exactly. Watford's first priority is getting things right at the back, but both sides determined that it's going to be good passing football which will get them results this season. And the referee out there is Paul Alcock from Red Hill, a public relations manager, his seventh season in the middle. As it's chipped for by Jason Rees, in goes Kerry Dixon, and over the top. Bright start from Luton. Rees back to Marvin Johnson. A reminder, of course, that nothing has changed about the back pass rule. Sommer coming out fast and dumping it onto the stand roof. He's a big fella, 29 years of age, six foot four. Not many players in the Football League are over 15 stone, but he's one of them. Here's Paul Furlong, the leading scorer for Watford last season. Scott Oakes breaks away for Luton. Telfer was hacked, but the game goes on as Julian James gets it forward to Williams. The back pass is on, but Dixon's got there. The poor back pass. Dixon intercepted it. But the goalkeeper came out well and Shepard blocked it superbly. Still, it's Luton Town. Julian James. Good challenge by Jason Drysdale. Picked up by Porter. Well played by 20-year-old Simon Shepard, trying to make a mark in this Watford side. He did well there. Coming out fast and blocking Kerry Dixon. It's starting brightly here. Williams wearing two, but brought down quite blatantly by Barry Ashby. Priest is coming over now to take charge with the left foot, is it? And curl it in. Dixon making a move. Now, Priest. And the touch almost by Dixon. Just an inch or two away from it. This is a great start by Luton tantalizingly in front of Kerry Dixon as he came in and the goalkeeper would have been stranded had he got a touch. Charlery back to Lavin. It's not a bad ball. It's good header from Porter straight into the arms of Sommer. Nicely held. Good move though from Watford. Nice drive. Good diving header from Porter. Goalkeeper perfectly positioned. Here's Charlery, Porter, Drysdale free on the left-hand side. Watford looking good here. Julian James goes across. Good deep cross to Basie. Well picked out. Now they've got an opening here as Charlery gets up. And it's Furlong. Good block by Sommer. And good goalkeeping by the American. Saves Luton Town, but it's still Watford going forward. Not a good cross this time from Jason Drysdale. And it's Oaks breaking now for Luton. There's space here for Martin Williams to get deep into the Watford half. Too strong for Telfer. 
Good cross. Kerry Dixon cleared by Holdsworth and out. Well, that was a good cross, good move, and nicely done by Charlery, brilliantly done by Sommer, and Luton was saved. Substitution for Watford as Johnson comes off, and on comes Keith Dublin. So less than half an hour gone, and Watford forced to make a change. Dixon can't quite control it tight enough. Having another go. I don't like a foul. No, says the referee. It's only a throw in. Kerry Dixon, uh, frustrated by the fact that he couldn't control it properly in the first place, then uh, goes in fairly strongly. Frustration, first of all, there. Then the high challenge, not according to the referee. The late little nudge was what irritated the crowd. As Billy Hales, the former Peterborough goal scorer, comes on to attend to him, this is a problem for Watford. They've lost Johnson already, and it looks as if they're going to lose Darren Baisley, who have been so effective down that right-hand flank. And the for Indeed, he's coming off, and it must mean that Lee Nogan will come on. Nogan comes on, brother of uh, Kurt Nogan, who used to play here, but uh, Nogan is a forward, he's a sharp player, he's also a wide player, so he will fit into the pattern, but that's a blow for Watford. Priest chopped down quite badly, that's a bad one. Barry Ashby goes in there, the referee is uh, getting his hand to his pocket, there's fist flying rather ridiculously as uh, Priest lies in agony on the ground, and that was ridiculous play by Watford. The referee had control of that one, and he's off. Ashby goes, not so much, I think, because of the challenge, but because of what happened afterwards. But the referee takes very decisive action. Off goes Barry Ashby, just at the time when Watford have lost two players and have had to make two substitutions. Well, the ball comes out here to Priest as he goes in to challenge Lavin. Priest gets it here. Now, Ashby comes flying at him and whacks him down. The referee is right on top of it. Thereafter, players take the law into their own hands rather stupidly. The referee could do very little there. And in the end, Ashby goes. Now, what can Luton Town make of this? Dreyer shoots, hits the wall. Dreyer again, miscues. Julian James under pressure quickly. It should have been got to him quicker by Dixon. And I imagine this day of sunshine will become even more fiery in the next few minutes. Referee a key figure now. Dreyer gets in there with a the header, and there goes Julian James, just wide. Williams holds it up well. Priest gets his foot away from it. Kerry Dixon now might be able to get in here. Great save. Beautiful save by Simon Shepherd. He needed all of his six foot four there. And that was a beautiful move. Dixon looked at it as if he'd outthwarted him there, but he was backpedaling and just gets fingertips to it. Great save. Well intercepted by Marvin Johnson. Johnson going forward, he's in with a chance here. Johnson, good save. Another brilliant bit of play by Simon Shepard. Well, Simon Shepard couldn't get into the England youth side, but it looks as if he might well get into the Watford side here. Great bit of play by the 20-year-old as Johnson came at him. John Dreyer coming forward for Luton, waiting out on that touchline while he gets his position. Drag coming to it here. Well beaten though by Holdsworth. Oh, there's space here, Johnson got it out well, and here comes Telfer. Paul Telfer accepting a very easy opportunity.
opportunity there as the ball is stabbed across the face of the goal and he's absolutely purple with dismay that uh, his goalkeeper should be his defense should be exposed like that was he offside well Watford players are still arguing but although he's in a very very isolated position that ball's come from a long way off Watford still saying that that was offside but uh, Telfer has opened the account for Luton Town early in the second half Lavin and Scott Oakes Forward goes Telfer again. Good cross. Kerry Dixon coming to it. Jason Reese picking it up at the back post here. Forward goes Julian James. And there's a foul there by Paul Furlong. Free kick to Luton Town just outside the penalty area. All the Watford players back defensively here, of course. Jason Reese going to run over it. it. Looks as if it's going to be him first. While the referee, Paul Alcock, pulls the defensive wall back. Reese first, and Scott Oakes, great drive, another good save. Right on target there, Scott Oakes, but once again, the stretching figure of Simon Shepherd saves Watford. Nicely done, right inside that near post, another good save. Here's Ken Chalery, wide to Gerard Lavin. Watford have pushed a lot of players up, Furlong's asking for the deep pass, this is for Furlong, gets it well! Great header and a superb save from Jürgen Sommer. And they're both at it. Lovely deep cross from the right. The perfect far post header, but a great save again off the post. Well, it's a bright second half here, although Watford, I don't think, will feel too cheerful about the way things are going for them. Porter waiting for players to come to him, leaving a bit of space behind. And there's uh, the shot, and it's knocked in. Surely it's going to go in. No. Telford gets it away, and James gets it away. There was Solomon in there. Dublin had a crack at it. Furlong had a crack at it. But it would not go over the line, and in the end, it was cleared by Julian James. The space here for Porter. Can he get a good cross in? Uses Drysdale. Good ball, well marked by Peak. And that's a booking, at least, for Jason Drysdale as he went on on uh, Jason Reese. It was a late one. And they're letting their frustration spill over here. And he's off! That really was an extreme measure by the referee. It was uh, certainly a... a unwarranted challenge but the referees uh, judged it to be dangerous play and he's off the second Watford player to go and Jason Drysdale who started this season with such high hopes personally and for Watford joins Barry Ashby in the dressing room John Moore the assistant manager of Luton Town shouting some advice backed up by David Pleat that's legal this season his porter forward for Furlong, Peak is with him. Porter's coming to support this good play. Up goes the goalkeeper, and there's a chance here for Solomon. And the referee had blown the whistle for a foul on goalkeeper Jurgen Sommer, so that wouldn't have counted. And on comes Andy McDade to treat him. Well, once again, the referee protecting the goalkeeper because of the challenge of Charlery, and the whistle's gone by now. And of course the new rules say that you can have a goalkeeper among the three substitutes on the bench, and they're invoking that new rule as Jürgen Sommer goes off to a very, very big round of applause, and on comes the Australian, Andy Pettersson, who probably would have played in this opening game, but he broke a toe. And although he's fit, they want to protect him a little bit longer. Pitch gets bigger by the second. Telfer shoots. It hits Dublin, who shrugs him off. Looking for a return now. Kerry Dixon. Oh, what a great goal. And that wraps it up.
Kerry Dixon took aim from well outside the area and wellied it. And even the inspired Simon Shepherd couldn't get at this one. A rebound off of Dublin. Then it comes straight to Kerry Dixon, who has a go from well outside the area. That's a classic goal of real Dixon vintage. He's had a great game, Simon Shepherd, but he had no chance with this one. Scott Oakes has got players supporting him. Ooh, not as casually as that, though, and Solomon does well. Here's Nogan, diving down to the line. Good effort, good save by Pedersen. And two good goalkeeping displays by Luton. Three in all here at Kenilworth Road. It's a real bonus for the beginning of the season. Nogan got through there rather too easily. And uh, Pedersen had to push that one away powerfully. Furlong, Solomon. It's a difficult one for Peak. Leans on his man. Furlong is in there. Furlong has a go. And Watford scored a deserved goal. But this might open up the last few minutes to a bit of excitement. Casual play there by Luton Town. And the ball was allowed to drop to the foot of the Watford player and uh, he put it in with the goalkeeper unsighted. First of all, Peak should have got that one better. They couldn't get it clear at all, and uh, Furlong puts it away, and it's two goals to one with three minutes on our clock left. Kerry Dixon, and Williams, Williams is in with a chance. Another good save, once more, by Simon Shepard. What a superb match he's had. And indeed, that was just about the last of the action at a sunny Kenilworth Road yesterday. It finished with the nine men of Watford still pushing forward, still causing Luton a few problems, and both teams looking rather weary in the heat. But in the end, though, it was victory for Luton in this week's derby by two goals to one. Second half goals by Paul Telfer and that cracker from Kerry Dixon before a late reply just three minutes from time by Paul Furlong. But it's Luton who take the points. Final score, Luton 2, Watford 1. David, how satisfying, given it was against nine men? It was a very warm day, and we'd played all our pre-season games in the evening. We hadn't played it in any game at 3 o'clock. Plus the fact that it was very, very warm yesterday. I thought Watford showed tremendous commitment to keep going. And... Um, whether I thought in the first 35 minutes before the first sending off, I thought we were the superior side. I was quite pleased with our passing yesterday and um, delighted, obviously, to get, a, uh, get away to a win. Watford was strong. Let's see, let's see the, you just mentioned the sending off. Let's just see the, uh, the incidents here and uh, get your views, David. Well, I mean, that's um, it's a crazy rush of blood. Um, there are a few of I think the referee was brave, really, to send him off. Um, there was another sending off of uh, Carlton Palmer in a Premiership game. Well, the second sending off was, uh, was for elbows. And once again, you see Mr Alcock right alongside the incident. He was perfectly positioned twice. Right. Um, but there are players who... This is the goal coming up. There was a query there about offside. But if you see that ball, it's delivered from a very wide position. It was at least a 45-yard ball. And I don't think Telford was offside. And that was a, a turn and rather sweet because when you score a second goal in 87 minutes, even we can't get in such a tangle. Not too many times, anyway, that to let the other a, team back. Indeed, that must have been a real bonus to see Kerry Dixon doing what he's, he's proved he can do year after year. Yes, I think Kerry, um, you know, Kerry needs a revival and uh, we, we're giving him that platform at the moment. And this week, of course, busy week. You've got Cambridge United coming up. We can have a look, actually, at how they got on uh, over the weekend. They, of course, were relegated down to uh, the second division. And they were playing Blackpool. Now, they'd never played them before. It was at the Abbey Stadium. Let's see how Cambridge started the season. A new manager at Cambridge, Gary Johnson, back in the hot seat. And new players, too. <laughs> Dean Barrick tried to mark his debut in style. That was one of a number of early chances for Cambridge. But the first goal came from one of the old firm, Mick Heathcote providing a deft touch from inside the penalty area. Cambridge dominated for much of the match, and it was no surprise when they added to their lead. A fine run from Steve Claridge, 
who gave Mick Danzey the chance to score at the far post. Perhaps more surprising was that Blackpool found a way back into the game before half-time. This time, Heathcote was the villain of the piece. He brought down Dave Bamber, and the Blackpool fans suddenly thought their journey may be worthwhile. Brian Griffith making it 2-1 at half-time. Cambridge restored their two-goal advantage with 20 minutes left. Danzi this time creating the chance and Steve Butler providing a cool finish. So a happy start to Gary Johnson's second spell as Cambridge manager, although there was a late scare as Blackpool pulled another one back. Substitute James Quinn, the scorer. But despite Quinn's urgency, it was too late by then. Cambridge 3-2 winners. There we are, David. Next stop, Abbey Stadium for you the, this week. Lovely pitch. Just, you know, playing a bit with Gary Johnson, which I'm delighted. I saw them play Forest last Saturday. They played very well. And um, it should be an exciting two-leg game. That's in the short term. What about the, the, the full season? What, uh, what are you hoping for and what are your aspirations for? for well, the... we haven't been beaten at home for quite a long time now. <laughs> I thought you meant this season. <laughs> no, we weren't beaten. Last November was our last uh, home defeat. And um, so we, we're getting stronger. And uh, we've got to keep picking up the away points and just hope that the younger players progress and become more manly very quickly. And that Peak and Priest and people like John Dreyer, who've had enough experience now to, you know, show their authority and spread their authority, uh, they've got to help the whole side uh, come on and, ke and keep improving. I think it could be start of another era. You're going to have to sell any more players, though? Well, we're hoping that um, we, we don't have to. I mean, um, it, it's always a prickly question, that, because... Um, one never knows around the, what's around the corner. We know it's always going to be difficult. We know we are always being looked at as one of the clubs that uh, clubs can take advantage of, but we're determined to resist. OK, Dave, we'll have to leave it there then. Thanks for your help today. I think that gets uh, a new season out of the blocks with uh, a good start. During the course of the autumn, there will be more live Sunday matches on Anglia, and in midweek, there'll be the Coca-Cola Cup. For now, though, thanks for watching. Goodbye. <laughs>